Good morning, and welcome to the CDRH Industry Basics Workshop. I'm Heather Howe, Deputy Director of CDRH's Office of Communication and Education. And I'm Elias Malice, Director of the Division of Industry and Consumer Education, or DICE, at CDRH. Thank you for joining us for today's program. CDRH's vision includes providing high-quality medical devices to patients first in the world. To do this, we must ensure that our regulations, guidances, and policies are clear and easy to understand. One way we do this is through real-time webinars on new guidances as they are issued. Another way is through today's event, the CDRH Industry Basics Workshop. Here, you can learn the basics on key aspects of device regulation. Through all of our programs, our goal is to provide information that you need to navigate the regulatory landscape. This is at the core of DICE's vision, to provide accurate, timely, and useful educational information about medical devices. Today's program is designed to be interactive. We really want to hear from you. Throughout the program, you can ask questions by calling 1-800-527-1401 or send questions by clicking the Ask a Question icon, which looks like a thought bubble at the top of your screen. After the program, if you have further questions, email dice at fda.hhs.gov. In addition to today's workshop, we also produce educational products that we encourage you to take advantage of. One of these resources is CDRH Learn. It's a multimedia website of educational materials covering a wide range of medical device regulatory topics. If you have a question about a particular aspect of medical device regulation, this is a great place to start. In addition, Device Advice is another industry education resource for you. Device Advice provides comprehensive regulatory assistance with over 1,500 web pages of information at your fingertips. We're excited to bring you today's workshop. We'll start each session with a presentation. At the end of the presentation, the speaker will be joined by a panel of experts from CDRH. We'll spend the remainder of the time taking your questions. We'll cover five topics today, so please join in for the topics that interest you. The first three topics will focus on what you need to know before a medical device gets to market. We'll start with the IDE program. At 11 a.m., we continue with the 510K program. At 12 noon, we pick up with the De Novo program. We'll then take a lunch break from 1 to 2 and resume the workshop with two post-market topics. At 2 p.m., we'll cover corrective and preventive actions, or CAPA. At 3 p.m., we'll wrap up the day with electronic medical device reporting, or EMDR. We really want to hear from you today, so please don't hesitate to ask your questions. Remember, you can do it over the phone, or you can click on the Ask a Question icon. It's that simple. Let's get started. Our first topic is the Investigational Device Exemption, or IDE program, presented by Dr. Soma Kalb, Acting Director of the IDE program at CDRH's Office of Device Evaluation. Here's Soma. Hello, my name is Soma Kalb, and I'm the Acting Director of the IDE program in CDRH. This presentation is on IDE basics. After watching this program, I hope you'll have a better understanding of the regulatory context of device clinical investigations, when an IDE is required, the IDE application process and FDA decisions on those applications, and the roles and responsibilities of key players in IDE studies. Let's start with the regulatory authority and framework for device clinical investigations. The authority governing the clinical investigation of medical devices can be found in Section 520G of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. The opening of that section starts with the text you see on the screen. It is the purpose of this subsection to encourage, to the extent consistent with the protection of public health and safety and with ethical standards, the discovery and development of useful devices intended for human use, and to that end, to maintain optimum freedom for scientific investigators in their pursuit of that purpose. You'll see that I've highlighted two phrases in this text, the protection of public health and safety and the discovery and development of useful devices. Those are two tenets that underscore the work of FDA. 
the protection of public health, and fostering innovation. The law is interpreted for us in the regulations. Title 21 of the Code of Fed Federal Regulations regards food and drugs and includes medical devices. There are several parts of the CFR that pertain to IDEs. These include Part 812, which is investigational device exemptions and is the primary subject of this, of this presentation. Also relevant are Parts 50 on informed consent, 54 on financial disclosure of investigators, 56 on institutional review boards. In addition to these regulations, the FDA Safety and Innovation Act was passed in 2012 and is relevant for IDEs. Part 1 of Section 812 immediately describes what an investigational device exemption is. An investigational device exemption permits a device that would otherwise be required to comply with a performance standard or to have pre-market approval to be shipped lawfully for the purpose of conducting investigations of that device. Simply, an IDE is a regulatory submission that permits clinical investigation of devices. IDEs are exempt from several regulations that would otherwise be required in order to use that device. The regulations that are exempt are listed on this slide. In addition to exempting a device from complying with several regulations, the IDE regulations also have other provisions. They describe the applicability of the IDE regulations. They provide administrative information, they outline the contents of the IDE application and describe the FDA actions on those IDE applications. They also assign responsibilities for participants in clinical investigations. I'll now talk about studies that require an IDE. There are several different ways to describe studies, and on this slide I have several terms that may be familiar to you. A pivotal study is a study that is often conducted by a manufacturer to support a marketing application. It's designed to collect definitive evidence on safety and effectiveness for a specified intended use, and it's typically in a statistically justified number of subjects. Often, feasibility studies are also conducted by manufacturers. These capture preliminary safety and effectiveness data, usually in a small number of subjects, and often these are designed to inform a pivotal study. In addition to those types of studies that are conducted by manufacturers, there are also studies that are conducted by other entities. These are often referred to as sponsor investigator studies. In many cases, these are not intended to support a marketing application. An example of a sponsor investigator study might be a study on a new indication for use for a commercially available device. This might require an IDE, and it may not be intended to support a future marketing application. Another type of study that you may hear about is an early feasibility study. These are studies that are typically conducted on a small number of subjects, and the device may be early in the development before its final design. There is a guidance available that outlines some of the provisions that may be followed in order to conduct an early feasibility study. The guidance is entitled Investigational Device Exemptions for Early Feasibility Medical Device Clinical Studies, including certain first-in-human studies. And one of the guiding principles in this guidance is that approval might be based on less non-clinical data than would be needed to support the initiation of a larger clinical study on a more final device design. Not all types of studies require IDEs, and you can look to the regulations for information on when an IDE is required. Typically, device studies are either exempt or not exempt, and if they're not exempt, they're either significant risk or non-significant risk, which determines what the scope of requirements are for that IDE. We'll first talk about exempt studies. Exempt studies are outlined in the Code of Federal Regulations in 21 CFR section 812.2C. So those devices that do not require an IDE are commercial devices used in accordance with their labeling, many diagnostic devices, testing of consumer preference of a modification or a combination of devices when you're not determining safety or effectiveness and you're not putting subjects at risk. Veterinary device studies and research on or with laboratory animals are also exempt, as are custom devices, which are defined in Section 812.3b. 
Now, in addition to those studies that are, that are exempt and are outlined in the regulations, there are other, two other groups of device use for which an IDE is not required. First of all, there's practice of medicine. In Section 1006 of the FD&C Act, it states, nothing in this act shall be construed to limit or interfere with the authority of a healthcare practitioner to prescribe or administer any legally marketed device to a patient for any condition or disease within a legitimate healthcare practitioner patient relationship. That means that FDA doesn't interfere with the practice of medicine. If a physician determines that the use of a device is appropriate for their patient, as long as they're not studying the safety and effectiveness of that device, they may use the device under practice of medicine. Under practice of medicine, the physician should be well informed about the product and use firm scientific rationale and sound medical evidence to determine whether they should use the device. They should maintain records on the use of the device and any adverse effects that might occur. An IDE is not required, although the institution might require IRB approval and informed consent. Other prohibitions, such as prohibition on promotion, still apply. Another area that might not require an IDE is called basic physiological research. This is research where you're investigating a physiological principle. There's no intent to develop the device for marketing. You're not evaluating the safety and effectiveness of the device, but you're using the device to address a research question. In these cases, the device is often used as a tool. For these cases, no IDE is needed, although IRB approval and informed consent should be obtained. So those are the areas where an IDE is not required. Let's start talking about when you're not exempt from the IDE. There are significant risk studies and non-significant risk studies. Significant risk is a term that's defined in the regulations in 21 CFR section 812.3 M. It's a device that presents a potential for serious risk to the health, safety, and welfare of a subject and is an implant or used in supporting or sustaining human life or of substantial importance in diagnosing curing, mitigating, or treating disease, or preventing impairment of human health, or otherwise poses a risk. Now, who makes a determination about the risk of a device study? The sponsor makes the initial determination, and then the IRB reviews that determination. The sponsor should provide the IRB with the device description, information on prior investigations, the investigational plan, the subject selection, the risk assessment, and the rationale used in making its significant risk or non-significant risk, SR or NSR, determination. Now, if the IRB disagrees with the sponsor's NSR assessment, the IRB must inform the clinical investigator and, where appropriate, the sponsor, and that's outlined in the regulations. Non-significant risk studies do not require the submission of an IDE to FDA, but they are subject to abbreviated requirements, such as labeling, IRB approval, informed consent, monitoring, some reporting, and prohibition on promotion. For non-significant risk studies, the IRB serves as the FDA's surrogate for review, approval, and continuing review of these studies. And an NSR study can start at the institution as soon as the IRB reviews and approves the study. For significant risk studies, the study cannot begin until an IDE is submitted and approved by FDA. Now, FDA is available to help in making risk determinations. In these cases, the sponsor should submit a study risk determination Q submission to FDA. FDA will issue a letter in response indicating whether the study is considered basic physiological research, exempt, not exempt, and if it's not exempt, whether it's significant risk or non-significant risk. Information on how to submit a Q submission can be found in the pre-submission programs and meetings with FDA staff guidance, which is shown on this slide. Note that when FDA makes a study risk determination, FDA is the final arbiter. It is not necessary for the IRB to conduct an independent separate assessment. We'll now move on to the IDE application and FDA decisions on those applications. The contents of the IDE application are outlined in the regulations in section 812.20. Here on the slide, you see the required components, the name and address of the sponsor, the report of prior investigations and investigational plan. This is the heart of the application. 
and more information on that aspect can be found in section 812.25. Information on how the device is manufactured, processed, packaged, and stored should also be provided. A copy of the investigator agreement, not necessarily the signed agreement, but your draft agreement with the required components should be included. A list of the name, address, and chairperson of each IRB that has been identified so far, as well as participating institutions. Any charge for the device to demonstrate that you're not commercializing under the IDE. Environmental assessment of the study. Labeling materials as well as any subject materials, including the informed consent that will be provided to um, study participants, as well as any additional information requested by FDA. Once an, uh, your application is submitted, FDA will send an acknowledgement letter to you with your IDE number. This will be a number that starts with the letter G. It's followed by two digits designating the year and four digits which are assigned sequentially. The IDE is sent to the appropriate review division based on intended use, for example, the cardiovascular devices or orthopedic devices. The lead reviewer in that division will then assemble a team of experts to review the application. There may be interactive review that occurs between the sponsor and the review team within 30 days. A decision is made within 30 days with management concurrence and FDA issues a decision letter to the sponsor at that point. After an IDE is approved, the sponsor will continue to make submissions to FDA until the IDE is closed. These include supplements for things like changes in your protocol or changes in your device, and these are described in section 812.35, as well as reports. There are required reports and optional reports that can be submitted to FDA and these are outlined in section 812.150. These might include your annual progress report, which is required, unanticipated adverse device defect reports, which are required, follow-up completion reports, your current list of investigators, and your final report, which is also required. Now, after you submit your original IDE application, FDA will issue a decision letter, and the FDA decisions can either be approval, approval with conditions or disapproval. In an approval decision, your study is approved for a specified number of subjects at a specified number of sites, and enrollment can begin once IRB approval is obtained. Approval with conditions approves the trial also for a specified number of sites and subjects, provided that conditions are addressed within 45 days. These conditions are referred to as deficiencies. Enrollment can begin also for approval with conditions as soon as IRB approval is obtained. Disapproval is a third decision that you might receive. With a disapproval decision, the study may not begin, and the sponsor must address deficiencies and submit an amendment and obtain FDA approval prior to starting the study. The regulations provide the regulatory basis for disapproval. There can be many circumstances under which your study might be disapproved, and these are outlined specifically in the regulations. There may be a failure to comply with regulatory requirements. The application might contain an untrue statement or omit important information. The sponsor might fail to respond to a request for additional information. A study might be disapproved if there's a reason to believe that the risks aren't outweighed by the anticipated benefits to the subject and the knowledge to be gained by conducting the study, if the informed consent is inadequate, if the investigation is considered to be scientifically unsound, or the device as used is considered to be ineffective. It can otherwise be disapproved if FDA believes it's unreasonable to begin by the way the device is used or the inadequacy of the report of prior investigations or the investigational plan, information on manufacturing, processing, packaging, storage, or installation of the device, or the monitoring and review of the investigation as outlined in the investigational plan. In 2012, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act was amended, and in it was a provision, 601, that stated that FDA shall not disapprove an IDE because the investigation may not support a substantial equivalence or de novo classification determination or approval of a device or the investigation may not meet a requirement, including a data requirement relating to the approval or clearance of a device or an additional or 
different investigation may be necessary to support clearance or approval of the device. This means that an IDE can't be disapproved on the basis that FDA believes the study design is inadequate to support a future PMA, 510K, HDE, or de novo classification. Disapproval must be based on concerns related to subject safety and protections. Although FDA cannot disapprove a study based on concerns related to the study design, we believe it is important to convey this information to our stakeholders within our disapproval letter. There are new elements to the FDA decision letters to allow us to convey this information. We provide this information in, under study design considerations and future considerations. Study design considerations are recommendations but not requirements regarding the study design that will help the study to achieve its goals, whether that goal is a future pivotal study or a future marketing application. On the other hand, future considerations are issues that are relevant for the future submission, for the future marketing application, not aspects of the study itself that, need, uh, that FDA believes might be changed. Sponsors are not required to respond to these elements, but they often do. So, in summary, the three decisions that tell you whether or not you can start the study are approval, approval with conditions, and disapproval. And you can start the study with approval or approval with conditions, but you can't with disapproval. Approval with conditions and disapproval decisions require that deficiencies are addressed. The letter will also include study design considerations and future considerations that do not require a response. They have no bearing on the IDE decision of approval versus disapproval. Information on these decisions can be found in a guidance called FDA Decisions on IDE Clinical Investigations. I'll now talk about office-level review of IDE application-specific issues. One of the goals of the CDRH Clinical Trials Enterprise is to conduct device trials in the U.S. in a timely, efficient, and cost-effective manner while maintaining appropriate patient protections. To help achieve this goal, a standard operating procedure, or SOP, is in place to improve efficiency, consistency, and predictability of the IDE process. And this SOP can be found at the link on your screen. Typically, IDE approvability decisions are made at the division level. With the SOP, an office-level clinical trials director is involved in selected submissions. This clinical tr trials director provides objective review of outstanding issues to help resolve specific challenges. The scope of this SOP is that it applies to original IDEs, new study supplements, and expansions of studies from feasibility to pivotal for which a decision other than full approval is made. The SOP has three main provisions. The first is a teleconference with sponsors. The second is review by the clinical trials director of disapproval and approval with conditions decisions. And the third is interaction of the clinical trials director during the review of third and subsequent round responses to disapproval or approval with conditions. Under the first provision, FDA offers a teleconference to occur within 10 days of a first round disapproval or second or later round disapproval or approval with conditions. Under the second provision, the clinical trials director and the review team meet prior to the 10-day teleconference to discuss the IDE and the remaining issues. Now, in addition to just reviewing decisions after they've occurred, if a third or subsequent round uh, response to disapproval or approval with conditions comes in, the clinical trials director is involved during the review and helps facilitate discussion based on his or her understanding of issues from his review of submissions across the divisions. The goals of the SOP are to help ensure consistency in decision making, to help facilitate the sharing of best practices across the divisions, to encourage higher levels of interaction, and to help prepare the sponsor to respond. This occurs through the 10-day meeting and the outside perspective on the letter that is provided by the clinical trials director. We'll now talk about the roles of the sponsors, investigators, and IRBs in conducting clinical studies for devices. The key players, as outlined in the regulations for, the, for a device clinical study, 
include the sponsor, the investigator, and the Institutional Review Board, or IRB. The sponsor initiates, but does not actually conduct the investigation. On the other hand, the investigator actually conducts a clinical investigation, and that is, the investigator is under whose immediate direction the test article is administered or dispensed to, or used, involving a subject. The IRB reviews and approves biomedical research at a given institution. The IRB conducts initial review as well as continuing review throughout the life of the study. The sponsor's responsibilities are outlined in the regulations. The sponsor is responsible for selecting qualified investigators and providing them with the information they need, including obtaining investigator agreements. The sponsor is responsible for ensuring proper monitoring of the study, selecting the monitors and securing compliance with the protocol, and evaluating and handling any unanticipated adverse device effects that occur. The sponsor is responsible for obtaining both IRB and FDA approval of the study. This is for both study initiation and for resumption of any terminated studies. They're responsible for the IIDE application and any supplements and for keeping the IRB and FDA informed of significant new information. The sponsor is responsible for keeping control of the devices and for complying with other parts of the regulation, such as subpart A on labeling and promotion, as well as import and export of devices. The sponsor responsibilities are outlined in section 812 subpart G. They're responsible for maintaining adequate records, including records of correspondence, investigator agreements, device disposition, and adverse effects and complaints. They're responsible for responsible for granting inspections to FDA and for preparing and submitting reports to the FDA. These include unanticipated adverse device effect reports, any withdrawals of IRB approval, the current investigator list, progress reports, any recall and device disposition reports, a final report, any failures to obtain informed consent, and any significant risk device determinations. The investigator responsibilities are outlined in subpart E of part 812. The investigator is responsible for conducting the investigation per the signed agreement, investigational plan, the FDA regulations, and any conditions of approval. They are responsible for protecting the right safety and welfare of the subjects under their care, for controlling the investigational devices, including supervising device use and appropriately disposing of any devices, and obtaining appropriate informed consent. The responsibilities include sim are similar to those for the sponsor. Um, they must maintain adequate records, including correspondence, detailed case histories on, on subjects, including the case report forms, informed consent documents, and medical records, um, records on device disposition, as well as any adverse effects or complaints, and of course, the protocol. Similar to the sponsor, investigators must be able to grant inspections to FDA and they prepare and submit reports. These reports are sent to the sponsor and the IRB. These include any unanticipated adverse device effect reports, withdrawal of IRB approval, progress reports, a final report, again, failures to obtain informed consent, and any protocol deviations that have occurred. Institutional review boards are discussed in detail in Part 56 of the, of the CFR. And the purpose of an IRB is to protect the rights and welfare of human subjects involved in FDA-regulated investigations and investigations that support applications for research, for example, IDEs or marketing permits. IRBs are responsible for risk determinations, review of protocols and informed consent, review of any changes to protocols, and continuing review of those protocols. The IRBs must comply with the IRB regulations, Part 56, as well as the IDE regulations in Part 812. Part 812 only briefly touches on the Institutional Review Board responsibilities, but they are referenced and they're an essential part of good clinical practice. FDA does periodic inspections of the IRB's records and procedures to determine compliance with the regulations. So in this presentation, I've discussed the regulatory context of device clinical investigations. I've described when an IDE is required, the IDE application process, and FDA decisions on those applications, 
as well as the roles of the key players in IDE studies. For more information, you can turn to these three resources on your slide, the CDRH Learn modules, which are multimedia industry education, device advice, which is text-based education on our website, as well as the Division of Industry and Consumer Education, DICE. Their contact information is also shown on this slide. Thank you for your attention to this presentation. Thank you for viewing the IDE program presentation. I hope you found the information helpful, and now we're going to try to answer your questions. You can submit questions by clicking the Ask a Question icon, which looks like a thought bubble on the top left corner of your screen. You can also call the phone number you see on the screen now if you'd like to ask your question live. Our next session, which is on the 510K program, will begin promptly at 11 a.m., so we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can before then. Here to help answer your questions is Soma Kalb who just gave the IDE program presentation. We're also joined by Elizabeth Hillebrenner, Policy Analyst in the Office of In Vitro Diagnostics and Radiological Health, or OIR, and David Litwack, Personalized Medicine Staff, also from OIR. Let's begin with some questions that have already come in. So our first question here is, is the only way to use a device that isn't commercially available by submitting an IDE? So, Mom. I can take that. Um, no, it is not the only way to um, use a device that isn't commercially available. There are other options as well. Um, there's a compassionate use program. So if um, a device is not commercially available but it's being studied under an IDE, a sponsor can submit what's called a compassionate, compassionate use supplement. Those are often requested by physicians um, to gain access to a device that a physician feels is in the best interest of their uh, patient. Um, there's also the option for um, obtaining access to that device through the Compassionate Use Program without an IDE. So if a device is available outside of the United States, a physician can request access to that device through the Compassionate Use Program. And information about the Compassionate Use Program can be found on the FDA website if you just Google expanded access, you'll find information about um, how to get access to those devices. Okay, great. Elizabeth and David, anything else you'd like to add? Just wanted to add that there's also um, associated with the Compassionate Use Program is the Emergency Use Program, whereby a, um, a physician can go ahead and treat the patient in an emergency and then notify the FDA within five business days. And um, more information on that program is available at the same website that Soma referred to. Great. Okay, so we have another question to come in. It, um, it's a pretty long one, so I'll read it um, slowly. It is not clear to me when an IDE is required. For example, is it required for a device already approved and in use when one is investigating a different application? So, for example, using a CBCT system for other than its original purpose. An example, using a dental CBCT system for the examination of extremities. Um, and then the follow-up, what type of design changes are allowed during an ongoing IDE? Can you give us some examples? So maybe start with the first one. So, um, so you can, whether or not an IDE is required depends on the risk level, whether it's considered significant risk. So that's the first thing to look at. If a device is being used within the approved indications for the product, um, it, uh, an IDE is not required. If it's being used outside the indications, which is what this question seems to be referring to, then if the device is significant risk and the um, physician or it is actually studying the device, doing research, and not just using the device under practice of medicine, then an IDE might be required. Now, just to make you know to clarify, if a physician wants to use the device um, under practice of medicine, they're not collecting safety and effectiveness data, but they just want to treat their patient, that can be done under practice of medicine, even if it's for a use that's not consistent with the labeling. Okay, excellent. And the part B of this question was, what type of design changes are allowed during an ongoing ID? So an ID is approved, and now there are some device design changes being considered. And can you give some examples of, of that? 
So, you know, you want to consider when you're making design changes how that might affect the interpretability of the results um, after the study is completed. Um, we design changes happen um, during the course of the study. You gain information about how the device works, what doesn't work during the course of the study, and there might be something that needs to be changed. Um, those are submitted to um, your IDE through an IDE supplement, and FDA will review them. Um, if it, FDA believes that there might be some impact on the outcome, the study outcomes, then um, you know we'll provide that information. And you might need to make a decision, a business decision, about whether it makes sense to make that design change. And okay. So for um, OIR and diagnostics, um, what type of design changes would be allowed during an ongoing IDE? Are there anything to add there? It's really um, up to the sponsor to decide what kind of design changes they might, uh, might desire. And we would review them on a case-by-case -case basis. So. Um, we don't have a set list of, of changes that are always allowable. It really depends on how the device is being used in the study and, and how the data are, are being used, the data from the device are being used to, to guide patient care. So it's not um, a one-size-fits-all approach. It's very study specific. So we would encourage sponsors who are considering these changes to, to really talk to their lead reviewer, um, get some feedback from them, and, and work interactively um, going forward. Okay. All righty, so our next question, um, it's about uh, the e-submitter program. Um, is a paper copy required for ID submission, or is it possible to submit solely through e-submitter? So um, I can answer that question. So uh, e-submitter is not available for IDEs. Um, uh, the, the, the question might be talking about the e-copy program, mm -hmm. um, and there is an e-copy guidance that outlines exactly how many copies are required for each type of submission. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I believe a paper copy is required for IDEs. Um, and so, um, but you can look to that guidance for um, specific information for uh, pre-submissions, IDEs, 510Ks, PMAs for everything. And the e-copy is required as well, except for certain um, types of IDE submissions. I believe the compassionate and emergency use are exempt from e-copy requirements, but all others, I believe, um, have, are subject to mandatory e-copy. Right. Adverse event reporting, I think. Uh, okay. Unanticipated adverse event reports also are exempt. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Our next question. What is the duration involved in the ID review process? Anybody can take that. I, I can take it. <laughs> well, it's... Um I'll, I'll take that one. Sure. It's um, uh, 30 days, so from the time the uh, IDE is submitted, FDA has 30 days to make a decision and inform the, the sponsor of that, or if FDA does not come to a decision, the IDE is actually considered approved. So. At 30 days. Okay, that sounds great. Um, next question's rolling in. Um, this is wonderful. Can multiple clinical studies be included under one IDE? Good um, question. Yeah, um, actually that is um, something that is fairly recent. Um, well, actually historically multiple studies have been um, able to be included under one IDE. Um, and now we actually have within our internal tracking system a way to track when multiple studies are occurring under one IDE. So a feasibility study and then a follow-on pivotal study might be under the same IDE. Okay. All right. Um, next question. Um, does the sponsor need to affix separate labels on the immediate packaging for each component, for each of the components of an assay? So this is going to be an OIR question. Um, software, instruments, reagents. Um, I, I would say... Uh, uh, not necessarily, you know, the, the labeling for a test, is, uh, for a test can be quite different. So if they are, uh, 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 submit, if they are uh, actually, dis if the manufacturer is distributing the assay to a lab, then some labels will need to be affixed. But if um, the, um, if it's a lab that has developed its own test, then they don't typically put labels on the components of the test. Okay. Okay, um, the next question, um, the pivotal studies of an IDE, must they be conducted in the, in the United States? 
Great question. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, pivotal studies do not have to be conducted in the United States. We do, it is our, our mission and one of our strategic priorities to, to help um, spur innovation and, and get access to United States patients first in the world. So we are hopeful that pivotal studies will include U.S. patients and we want to work with you to, to make that happen, but there is no requirement that they be conducted in the United States. Uh, right, and our, I, our IDEs only have oversight over United States sites and subjects. Mm -hmm. So um, when we grant approval for an IDE and we list the number of approved su subjects and sites, that only includes the U.S. cohort. Okay. Um, next is about case report forms. Are draft case report forms a requirement for an IDE submission for FDA review? Soma? I, I, well, they can be. Um, they often, it's helpful for FDA to review the case report forms to make sure that our understanding of how the um, data are being collected is consistent with what's outlined in the protocol. Um, I, you know, if you look at the regulations, case report forms are not listed there, but I would say that it is a uh, fairly common standard practice um, for the application to include uh, case report forms and for FDA to review them. And I think that would fall under the part of the application additional information as requested by FDA. Yeah. And it's really in the sponsor's best interest to give that to us so that we have a chance to provide feedback. We don't want them to get to the end of an expensive trial that has exposed patients to, to risk and not have the data they need to support a marketing application because mm -hmm. the case report form wasn't designed properly or didn't have the appropriate field. So it's really you know, in everybody's best interest if we're on the same page with respect to the case report forms. Okay. Um, or, <clears throat> excuse me, our next question is about um, IVDs. Could the panel, um, I'll get Elizabeth and David here, um, could the panel, I'm sorry, it's scrolling, uh, please provide uh, additional details and examples for how to determine whether an IVD is significant risk. So IVDs, significant risk. Walk us yeah, through that. I can, I can take that one. So it's, it's hard to come up with exact rules because every investigation is different. But um, I, I would say we look at a number of factors when determining risk. So if uh, what, are the, what is the uh, condition that is being treated so what, uh, what are the alternative treatment options? So if patients enter a trial, what are they, are they being deprived of, for instance, known effective therapy by entering the trial? Um, uh, other examples might be if, um, uh, what are the treatment decisions that will be made based on the result from the IVD? Uh, so really what we are asking is, in asking those questions, what we're asking is, what are the consequences of a false test result? So if the test result reported the wrong thing, what would, the, what would happen to the patient? And is that going to cause harm or not? Uh, but each, uh, each trial, each investigation is different. And so we usually have those discussions in, in, the, um, in the context of a pre-submission. So it sounds like this um, caller an emailer was interested in trying to understand whether or not their possible trial is significant risk, you would recommend engaging the FDA in some type of pre-submission interaction. Right. If, okay. they, if they don't, also their local IRB can be of assistance in this as well. And, well, I was just going to mention there is a formal um, a mechanism available for determining the risk level of your device, whether it's non-significant risk or significant risk, and that is a study risk determination Q submission. Um, and if you look at your slides, I have the link to the pre-submission guidance, which includes information about how to, what you need to submit for that. Um, Elizabeth, did you want to comment on important information to include in the study risk determination? Sure. In OAR, we get a lot of these. Um, so we ask that sponsors make sure that they include the study protocol and a device description. We need those pieces of information to make a formal risk determination. And by formal, I mean we'll send you a formal letter that says FDA has reviewed your protocol and we've determined you are significant risk or non-significant risk. And so then you'll have something in writing that you can show your IRB, your investigators, or whoever you, you might want to, um, to show FDA's 
final cut. You are not required to come to us to make that cut. Um, that's something you can make with your, you know, in discussion with your IRBs. But if you want our input, we will do that for you in writing. Great. Um, the next question is a long sentence, so I'll read it. Um, if a company is providing financial support to a medical manufacturer and they are collaborating with them to develop a device, would that company be considered I'm sorry, um, the sponsor? So companies providing financial support to a medical manufacturer and they're collaborating, would that company be then considered the sponsor for purposes of an ID? I would say not necessarily. Um, it depends on who is willing to assume the responsibilities of a sponsor. And the one who's submitting the IDE is the one who is re assuming the responsibilities of the sponsor. Um, those are outlined in the regulations, I think. Um, I can't remember the section offhand. Um, but sponsor responsibilities can be found directly in Part 812. And uh, depending on who, does, who takes that responsibility would be Okay, and the part B to this, which you may have answered, is so with the that company be responsible for submission of an IRB proposal and seeking FDA approval, or would the metal, medical manufacturer be better qualified to do that? So it's not so much a matter of who's better qualified; it's a matter of who's the stated responsible party. Depends on their business arrangement, yes. right? So they have to have a business arrangement that assigns responsibility to one entity, and that entity would be responsible. And it's, um, I think it's 812 part 3N that defines the sponsor. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, here's a short question. Um, it's a good one. Um, is an ID always followed by a 510K or a PMA? Uh, I can start, I guess. Um, not necessarily. There are sponsor investigator studies that um, are uh, conducted purely for research purposes and are not necessarily intended to support a future marketing application. Um, also, there are many 510Ks that don't require clinical data. There are also um, PMA supplements that don't require clinical data. So I would say um, definitely not necessarily. Okay. And we see a lot of sponsor investigator studies that are conducted under IDEs that are really just um, physicians that are interested in collecting data to help guide the practice of medicine, not necessarily to support a marketing application. So that's, that's very common. Okay. Um, this next question talks about um, the device being available outside of the United States. It's a follow-up. Um, if the device is available outside of the United States, um, you said, we said, um, that one can use the expanded access program does the manufacturer of the device have to submit the ID to the FDA? Or does the physician have to submit a protocol to the IRB or FDA first and then import the device? So uh, this is a device that's available right. outside of the United States trying to bring it into the U.S. Right. So if, if the device is being studied under IDE, the manufacturer would submit an IDE supplement. If the device is not being studied under an IDE, but a physician in the U.S. Um, needs access to a device that is available overseas, either they can submit the compassionate use request or the uh, manufacturer can, can submit the compassionate use request. Um, the compassionate use request requires concurrence by the manufacturer on the use of the product, and it also requires a device description. So that may need to be obtained by the physician or the physician can provide the patient and case specific information to the manufacturer yes. and the manufacturer can make the submission um, but i just you know i'd like to clarify a little bit that um, compassionate use uh, with within cdrh is a little bit different than it is um, for um, what are for drug uh, drug products um, those have those are submitted uh, as single patient INDs and they require a protocol. Uh, we don't actually have, require a protocol, we require a description of uh, the device, concurrence from the manufacturer as I just mentioned, um, uh, a statement of why the use of the product is medically necessary, why other available treatments um, won't work for this particular patient, um, and you know generally a plan for follow-up and how the patient will be treated is, you know, is part of the application, but 
um, it's not a protocol the same way that it is with a single patient IND. And the, okay, and the question, the, the follow-up of this question was about uh, the timing of engaging the IRB versus FDA first or second. Uh, that often depends on the IRB. It, the IRBs often like to see the FDA approval before they will issue an approval. Um, we require that IRB approval is obtained from the chair of the IRB. So this is another difference between the single patient INDs. Um, concurrence um, by the IRB chair is required, but um, to, to be obtained prior to the procedure, but it doesn't necessarily need to come in to the request that comes to the FDA because we understand that sometimes uh, IRBs like to see the FDA approval before they make their decision. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, our next question, um, if an ID is being used for compassionate or emergency use, must the ID regulations be followed, for example, labeling records and reporting? Well, report, they're not specific to, did you say it's, can you repeat that I'll repeat again? it, sure. If an ID is being used um, for compassionate or emergency use, must the ID regulations be followed, for example, labeling rec records and reporting requir requirements within the ID regulations? Well, if it's within an IDE, it seems like it's within an IDE, all of yes. those requirements apply. As far as labeling, I think any device that's being used would be, need to be labeled as investigational, not approved for um, human use. Um, and there is a specific follow-up report that is required for compassionate use cases that um, is different than you know the annual report and the semi -investi semi annual investigator list and other reports that are required under the IDE, um, but I think all of the same reporting requirements uh, exist and apply. Okay. Um, maybe not to that specific case, but the IDE is still open. So yeah, on a case by case basis, yeah, we might determine sure. that the patient needs to be followed according to the IDE protocol as well, and just analyze separately from the cohort at the end of the study. Or we might say that this patient needs to have separate types of follow-up, or it's all case by case depending on the situation. Um, so that's something that would be worked out with the lead reviewer in the review of your compassionate use request. Yeah. Okay. So um, the next question speaks to following up about significant risk and dis deciding that. The regulatory definition of significant risk is open to interpretation. Is there any CDRH reference document that explains FDA's interpretation or provides examples of prior studies that were considered significant risk? There's the, um, the guidance for IRBs and sponsors on uh, risk determination that is referenced in the pre-submission guidance, um, so that can help you link to that, um, mm -hmm. and that provides our interpretation of, right. of risk and some Q&A as well. Right. There's a, there's a couple of guidance documents. I don't have them off the top of my head. I th the one that Elizabeth is mm -hmm. referring to, I think if you were to Google um, significant risk and non-significant risk studies, um, you'll find it, you know, FDA guidance. Um, and there's also um, frequently asked questions about medical devices guidance that also touches on the topic as well. And let me also add that we hope sometime in the next few months to be releasing a, a new guidance describing specifically uh, ha, ha, uh, some of the parameters around risk determination for IVDs that are used in drug trials. So okay. that uh, viewers should be looking for that in the future. Okay. And I'll just add one more thing. Sure. And in the, uh, in the significant risk, non-significant risk guidance document, there are examples at the end of studies that are considered um, to be significant risk and non-significant risk. Okay. And if anyone needs those links, if they email uh, D-I-C-E at FDA, we can uh, provide the links to you if you can't find them. Great. And I think we only have time for a couple more questions. A couple more questions. Okay, I'll make them good. <laughs> um, thanks for the, the questions coming in. There's quite a few here. Um, okay, we'll tackle this one. Is an ID required for an investigational companion in vitro diagnostic? for an exploratory POC study of an investigational product. Also, what level of quality is required for the um, companion diagnostic, e.g. validation, CLIA, or QSR? 
I think that's an OIR question. Right, yes. Um, so, again, the details of if an ID is required or not will depend on the, the exact circumstances. So, and I don't remember all of the different factors, but in terms of, um, first of all, an IDE would be required. The, the, the device is subject to an I, the IDE regulation, even if there is an IND. Um, and then the, the stage or the phase of development of the therapeutic product typically doesn't, um, is, doesn't factor into the risk determination. Typically, exploratory studies will end up being exempt or non-significant risk, but there have been a few exceptions to that rule in unusual, in unusual circumstances. So there's that. And then certainly labs that are doing testing on patients are, are subject to CLIA, but under the IDE regulation, they are not subject to QSR, except for, I believe, design controls. And I, um, uh, and I don't remember if there was another part to that question or not, but. Okay, and I think that was it. Okay. Um, so we have time for one last question, and it's this. Can staged IDE approval approach be used for a study where the initial study data meets the feasibility study requirements, and the second stage of the protocol is for the pivotal study of a device which is in clinical use in the European market for over three years? That's a pretty specific question. Yes. <laughs> I will give a little bit broader response, I think. Um, generally, the staged approach um, is used when you can outline the parameters of your pivotal study at the uh, beginning. And so nothing would really change with the design of the study in moving from your uh, smaller cohort to the expanded full cohort. So I don't imagine that expanding from feasibility to a pivotal study would fall under the um, staged approach um, requirement. Okay. Okay. I, I'm sorry, I have to cut you off. That's all the time we have. Thank you, panelists. You did a great job. And thank you all for your participation and for your thoughtful questions. This concludes this portion of our CDRH Industry Basics Workshop. Please stay tuned for our next presentation on the 510K program which will be begin at 11 o'clock. Also, please send us your feedback by completing the survey, which is provided on our website at www.fda.gov backslash CDRH webinar. See you in just a little while.
Hello, my name is Lieutenant Commander Kimberly Permadio. I am a Regulatory Operations Officer within the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. I have held various positions within the center, including being a pre-market reviewer within the Office of Device Evaluation. During today's presentation, we're going to cover the fundamentals of the 510K program. A 510K, which is also referred to as a pre-market notification, is one of the major pathways for bringing a device to market. Actually, the 510K is the most common pre-market submission for medical devices. During today's presentation, we are going to cover the following learning objectives. I'm going to provide you with an understanding of medical device classifications and how classifications apply to 510Ks. We're going to cover what is a 510K and when it is required and the different types of 510K submissions. We're going to talk about what should be included in your 510K, the actual content, and what should be submitted to the FDA. We're also going to talk about the 510K submission process and the timeline on how and when the FDA will communicate with you during the review of your 510K. And lastly, we're going to cover what are 510K decisions and what they mean. So let's begin. Let's talk about device classification as it relates to 510Ks. The FDA regulates medical devices based on risk. Class 1 devices are considered low-risk devices. These devices are subject to general controls. Most, but not all, Class 1 devices are exempt from the pre-market notification process. Class 2 devices, which are considered moderate-risk devices, are subject to general and special controls. Most, but not all, Class 2 devices require a pre-market notification. This is going to be the topic of our presentation today, mostly. Now, Class 3 devices are considered high-risk devices, and these are subject to general controls and pre-market approval. Most product codes are found on all 510K clearance letters. This can be extremely useful to you as you can search for relevant products that have similar product codes. Within this slide, I've provided you references to the, the guidance document on medical device classification product codes, which provides you additional information on what product codes are and how they can be used, as well as my favorite reference is the product classification database. This database can be extremely useful. It is a public database, and it provides you a wealth of information on the appropriate regulatory pathway for different devices. On this slide, I have provided you example from the product classification database. This example is for an infusion pump, and as you can see, this is an output from the product classification database, which lists a whole bunch of information, including that three-letter product code, FRN. And what's even more useful is that it specifically outlines a submission type on the product classification. So here, as you can see where the blue arrow is pointed, the submission type is for a 510K. So for an infusion pump, you would submit a 510K for this type of product. So what do you do if you can't determine the appropriate device classification? So you've done your due diligence and you've looked in the product classification database, but you're still unable to determine the appropriate classification for your product. You may want to consider the 513G program. The 513G program is a request for information to the FDA. The FDA will respond by providing you what they think is the appropriate regulatory pathway for your device. There are a few caveats to the 510K or 513G program that I'd like to provide you. There is a 513G user fee, so please keep that in mind when you are preparing to submit the 513G. FDA responses to 513Gs do not constitute FDA clearance or approval. So if you submit your 513G and the FDA responds with the appropriate regulatory pathway, you still must comply with that pathway, such as the submission of a 510K or the submission of a pre-market approval application. On this slide, I've provided you references to the 513G program and the user fees associated, and please refer to those for additional information. So next, let's talk about the actual 510K program. So let's first talk about what a 510K is. As I had mentioned before, a 510K is also referred to as a pre-market notification. The reason why a pre-market notification is also referred to as a 510K is because it actually refers to the Section 510K of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. So that is why people often say 510K and pre-market notification interchangeably. Within 21 CFR, which stands for Code of Federal Regulations, 807 subpart E, this actually outlines the information that is required in the submission of your 510K. A 510K is considered a marketing clearance application, therefore the FDA clears 510Ks. The clearance is based on the determination of substantial equivalence. 
Now, on the contrary, a 510K is not just a form. A 510K can be an entire submission that can be hundreds of pages long. It all depends on the device and what needs to be submitted to demonstrate substantial equivalence. A 510K is also not establishment registration or device listing, and a 510K is not a pre-market approval. Therefore, it is inappropriate to say that FDA has cleared your 510K and therefore your product is FDA approved. Only products or devices that are approved through the pre-market approval process are considered FDA approved. So keep in mind that a 510K receives FDA clearance and therefore it is FDA cleared. So now let's talk about substantial equivalence. This is the bread and butter of the 510K program. Substantial equivalence is basically the demonstration that your new device compared to a predicate device has the same intended use and the same technological characteristics, or it has the same intended use and the differences in technological characteristics do not raise different questions about safety and effectiveness. It's very important to note that substantial equivalence is is the whole point of the 510K program, and that's what you are trying to demonstrate in your submission. So what is a predicate device? You are demonstrating substantial equivalence. So you have your new device and a predicate device. The predicate device is actually a legally marketed device that is typically cleared through the 510K process. And this is used for comparison of your device, the new device, to the predicate device. And this is the premise of substantial equivalence. On this slide, I've provided you multiple references to the 510K program. Specifically, I want to draw your attention to the final guidance, the 510K program, which is titled Evaluating Substantial Equivalence and Pre-Market Notification. This is an extremely important guidance document for anyone who's participating in the 510K program, and I recommend that you take the time to review this guidance thoroughly. I will be referring to this guidance throughout the rest of this presentation, so please make a note of the link to this guidance. Additionally, there was a public CDRH Learn webinar, which provides additional information as well. And then the link at the bottom on how to find and effectively use predicate devices is also helpful. So the 510K decision-making flowchart. I don't expect you to be able to read this flowchart right now. We'll go over the decision points of the next slide. But take your attention to Appendix A of that 510K guidance document that I referred to on the previous slide. This decision-making flowchart is what you should be referring to when you're demonstrating your substantial equivalence. So let's go through each of those decision points. So this is what the pre-market reviewers are going to be looking at when they look at your 510K submission to make sure that you're following through the flowchart and demonstrating substantial equivalence. The first point, or decision point, is is the predicate device legally marketed? Therefore, has the predicate device received the appropriate clearance or approval as necessary? The second decision point is do the devices have the same intended use? This is very important because it's going to be difficult for you to demonstrate substantial equivalence to a predicate device that has a different intended use. The third decision point is do the devices have the same technological characteristics? And if they do not have the same technological characteristics and they raise different questions of safety and effectiveness, then you're going to move through decision points four and five. If there are differences, again, in decision point five, you're, it's two parts. You're going to provide the methods acceptable for your performance testing to demonstrate substantial equivalence, and you're going to provide the data that is used to demonstrate that substantial equivalence. So the reviewer is going to look to make sure that you've addressed these decision points. So please take the time to review the flowchart and make sure that your 510K submission provides the information necessary. So when is a 510K typically required? A 510K is typically required in three scenarios. The first is if you're introducing a new device to the market for the first time. The second could be changing the indications for use of a previously cleared device. And the third could be making significant modifications to a previously cleared device. In these situations, this is when a 510K would be required. And you would require 510K clearance before you could market the product. On this slide, I've provided references. One of the ma main questions that we receive is you've made changes to your product and whether or not it requires the submission of a new 510K. So if you have questions on whether or not you've made a modification to existing device, please refer to the following references. So there are three types of 510K submissions. There is a traditional 510K, an abbreviated 510K, and a special 510K. We're going to go through each one specifically. For a traditional 510K, you must submit the required elements of 21 CFR 807.87. These are typically the administrative requirements such as the business name, the trade name, things like that. The traditional 510K relies on the demonstration of substantial equivalence. 
It's important to note that a traditional 510K can be used under any circumstance. The abbreviated and special 510K can only be used if certain criteria are met. An abbreviated 510K must also include the required elements of 21 CFR 807.87, but an abbreviated 510K relies on the use of guidance documents, special controls, and recognized standards. Under certain conditions, sponsors may not need to submit test data in an abbreviated 510K because you are following the FDA recommendations and guidance documents or um, recognized consensus standards. So that's when an abbreviated 510K may be appropriate. A special 510K must also include the required elements of 21 CFR 807.87. However, a special 510K is appropriate when you are making device modifications to a manufacturer's own legally marketed device. Therefore, you're making modifications to your own product, so you own the predicate device. It's important to note also, though, for a special 510K to be appropriate, the modification may not affect the intended use or fundamental scientific technology of the device. Because the reason for this is, is that data is not typically submitted with a 510K or special 510K. On this slide, I've also provided you with some additional references on how to prepare a traditional, abbreviated, and special 510K as well as a 510K screening checklist and a link to the appropriate 510K forms. So what do you do if you have a low or moderate risk device with no identifiable predicate device? So you've taken the time and done your due diligence and you're unable to identify an appropriate predicate device. You may want to consider a de novo. For, for more information on the de novo program, please refer to other modules within CDRH Learn. Next, let's talk about the content of a 510K and what should be submitted in your 510K. On this slide, I have provided you with various bullets on what should be included in the content of your 510K. There are various administrative requirements, certain forms, and cover letters, but specifically during this talk, we're going to go over the highlighted aspects in more detail. So let's first start off by talking about the intended use and the indications for use. The intended use is the general purpose of the device or its function and encompasses the indications for use. So the intended use is the broad term and indications for use is encompassed within the intended use. The indications for use actually goes into more detail and describes the disease or condition the device will diagnose, treat, prevent, cure, or mitigate, including a description of the patient population for which the device is intended. You want to make sure that your intended use and indications for use is consistent throughout your 510K. Make sure that it, the, they're both the same in your indications for use statement, your proposed labeling, your instructions for use, etc. There is a recommended format for your indications for use statement. Please refer to form FDA 3881. And when you submit that form, make sure that you identify whether or not your product is considered prescription use or over the counter. The next aspect of your content of your 510K should be your 510K summary. The 510K summary is a high-level discussion of the content within your 510K. Within your 510K summary, you should cover the elements covered in 21 CFR 807.92. Your 510K summary should include sufficient detail to provide an understanding of the basis for your determination of substantial equivalence. During the review of your 510K, the FDA will verify the accuracy and completeness of your 510K summary. For more information on what should be included in a 510K summary, please refer to that final guidance, the 510K program, specifically Appendix B, which covers the 510K summary document requirements, as well as provides a great example of a complete 510K summary. Next, let's talk about FDA-recognized consensus standards. This is a voluntary program and is used to simplify and streamline the 510K review process. Sponsors can declare conformance to consensus standards in order to help their review process. Sponsors should document the extent of their conformance in their 510K application via the form FDA 3654. If you have additional questions regarding the standards program, please refer to the following guidance. As well as there is a public recognized consensus standards database which you can search for FDA recognized consensus standards. FDA guidance documents. This is very important to understand because FDA guidance documents actually represent FDA's current thinking on a topic. FDA guidance documents can be device specific or they can be general and apply to multiple different devices. However, guidance documents do not create or confer any rights for or on any person and do not bind the FDA or the public. So really the guidance documents provide FDA's current understanding or current thinking. 
Alternative approaches may be used that are outside of the guidance documents if those approaches satisfy the requirements of the applicable statutes and regulations. There is a public FDA guidance document database, which you can search for FDA guidance documents. I want to recap and go back to that product classification database, which I told you I think is an invaluable tool. On the bottom of that product classification for the infusion pump under the product code FRN was also listed these FDA recognized consensus standards and guidance documents. As you can see, they are specific to infusion pumps, so you can refer to them if you are developing a 510K submission regarding for infusion pumps. It can be extremely helpful and please refer to the product classification database to get this additional information. Next, within your 510K, you should make sure you include a detailed device description. Within your 510K, you want to include the description of the device design, including anything that you think is important for the reviewer to be able to understand the intended use and the purpose of your product. You, know, you can include anything from figures to diagrams, anything which would be helpful to describe your device. Additionally, you want to include a listing of materials, specifically the patient contacting materials, because that will indicate what types of biocompatibility testing would be appropriate. Additionally, within your device description, you want to include energy sources, such as battery or AC power, and you also want to include any key technological features. Within your 510K, you also want to include a detailed substantial equivalence discussion. The substantial equivalence discussion is the foundation of your 510K. So please refer back to the 510K decision-making flowchart and go through each of those decision points so that you are clear and the reviewer is clear as to how you are demonstrating substantial equivalence. The 510K review standard is, again, it's comparative. So you're comparing your new device to your predicate device. Within the 510K program final guidance, it addresses some specific points that I wanted to make note of during this presentation. The first one is that multiple predicate devices are okay, but only under certain circumstances. So for additional references or um, examples on when a multiple predicates may be appropriate, please refer to that guidance. It's important to note that split predicates are inconsistent with the 510K regulatory standard. And lastly, within the guidance, it addresses a new term called reference devices. Reference devices may be used to support scientific methodology or standard reference values. Reference devices are not predicate devices. Therefore, reference devices typically won't come into your 510K until around decision point four. So please keep that in mind when you're, you're providing your substantial equivalence discussion. Within your 510K, you should provide your proposed labeling for your device. Your device labeling should comply with the requirements of 21 CFR 801. Copies of all your proposed labeling are recommended including your package insert, service manuals, instructions for use, advertising, and or promotional materials. The directions for use should include the, your specific intended use statement and any warnings or contraindications or limitations for your device. Your labeling in your 510K should be submitted as a final draft. Copies of your predicate device, device's labeling is recommended, but it's not required. If you have additional questions or need further clarification, please refer to the Introduction to Medical Device Labeling as the link provided on this slide. Next, we're going to talk about performance testing. Performance testing can be bench, animal, or clinical. Performance testing is actually determined specifically to the complexity of your device and its intended use. So every 510K is going to have different performance testing, depending upon the difference in the technological characteristics or the differences in the new device compared to the predicate. I, re I recommend that you consider FDA guidance documents, especially the device-specific guidance documents, which may provide recommendations on appropriate performance testing. You may consider comparative testing to demonstrate substantial equivalence, which could be side-by-side -side comparison testing of your device compared to the predicate, but that's not required. So if you are unable to obtain the actual predicate device, consider comparative testing in the sense of a table which outlines the comparison of the two different specifications and their intended use, et cetera. Within your performance testing, you should include your test methods, your acceptance criteria, and your test results for review. I want to make a specific note on performance testing, clinical performance testing. Clinical testing is, is most often not required for 510K submissions. However, clinical data may be requested in the following situations. When you have a new or modified indications for use, clinical testing may be needed. If you're making significant technological changes, that may also require new clinical data. 
or when non-clinical testing methods are limited or inappropriate because of the indications for use or device technology. Please refer to the Fight and k program final guidance for additional examples and explanation on when clinical data may be appropriate. So when we're talking about the content of 5 k just to wrap up with some key considerations. So make sure your information is complete and organized. Make sure your 5 k is organized. Include a table of contents. Make sure you use tabs and paginate appropriately. If you can, use tables and graphs. This is, can be extremely helpful for the reviewer during their review. And use visual aids whenever possible. Within your 5 k you want to make sure that you clearly identify basic 5 k requirements, such as the 5 k summary or the indications for use form. And make sure that you're consistent throughout your 5 k submission. As we had mentioned earlier about the intended use and indications for use, make sure that they are consistent throughout your 5 k and again, please follow any applicable guidance documents or device-specific checklists. They're there to help you prepare your 510K. On this slide, you have some references to the content of a 510K as well as some 510K formatting tips. Please refer to those for additional information. So lastly, I want to talk about, the, for the content of the 510K, I want to provide you with some information regarding the pre-submission program. There is a guidance document titled Requests for Feedback on Medical Device Submissions, the Pre-Submission Program and Meetings with the Food and Drug Administration staff. This can be a valuable program. It is a way for you to obtain feedback from the FDA before the actual submission of your 510K. But typically, a pre-sub for a 510K is only appropriate for unique situations, such as when you may need clinical data to support your demonstration of substantial equivalence. Through the pre-submission program, you would submit a formal written request to the FDA, and you would request either a formal written response, a meeting, or teleconference to address your concerns. Because this is a formal written request, it is subject to e-copy requirements, which we'll discuss during the submission of a 510K, but it's important to note that they are subject to e-copy. For additional information on the pre-submission program, I have provided you the link to the guidance on this slide, as well as the public CDRH Learn webinar on the pre-submissions and meetings with FDA staff. So now let's talk about the 510K submission process. But before we get into the actual timeline, I wanted to provide you with some important notes before you actually submit your 510K. The first is your submission to the FDA. You must submit two copies of your 510K. One of those two copies must be submitted in electronic format, or what is also referred to as an e-copy. The FDA does not return your 510K submission after its review, so you will not get back the hard copy. When you mail your 510K, please make sure that you mail it to the appropriate document control center, the address provided on this slide. For additional references, you can refer to our addresses for submissions link that is also provided on this slide. So I referred to the e-copy, <clears throat> and so I'd like to talk about the e-copy program a little bit so you have a better understanding. A valid e-copy is a requirement for pre-market submissions, including the 510K. An e-copy is defined as an exact duplicate of the paper submission. An e-copy is accompanied by a paper copy of the signed cover letter and the complete paper submission. So for your 510K, you will submit one electronic copy or e-copy and one paper copy. If you have additional questions regarding the requirements of an, a valid e-copy, please contact our e-copy experts and refer to the e-copy program for medical device submissions website, which provides a great instructional video on how to nomencl uh, the appropriate nomenclature for your submission and things like that. Also, before you submit your 510K, you have to submit your user fee. 510K submissions are subject to user fees. Your user fee must be received on or before the time the application is submitted. FDA will not accept the 510K for filing if the fee is not paid. There is a standard user fee and a small business reduced user fee. If you believe that you are a small business, which makes less than $100 million in sales, you must submit your small business determination qualification first. If you submit the standard 510K user fee, and then subsequently later get a small business determination qualification, the FDA will not refund you the difference. So please make sure that if you think you are a small business, that you get your small business determination number first, so that way you are eligible for the reduced fee. On this slide, I've provided you references to 510K review fees, as well as the medical device user fee, small business qualification and certification guidance. So please refer to those if you believe that you are a small business. Next, let's talk about the 510K submission process. The 510K submission process 
is very important to understand because this is going to be how and when the FDA communicates with you during your review. So that way you are informed and your company is informed as to when your 510K and where your 510K is at. So this timeline has been simplified and please keep in mind that the days are in calendar days. For the actual content of the 510K submission process, please refer to the 510K submission process website. This website provides the timeline as well as additional links and resources to guidance and other things that help to simplify that timeline. So let's begin with the 510K submission process, the timeline. So day one is the day that FDA receives your 510K submission. By day seven, the FDA will either send you an acknowledgement letter or a hold letter. If you receive a hold letter, that means that there are issues with your user fee and or e-copy. So if you receive a hold letter, your 510K will not proceed forward to be accepted for filing until you have resolved the user fee and or e-copy hold issues. By day 15, after your 510K has passed through the user fee and e-copy, the FDA will conduct what's called an acceptance review. By day 15, you will find out from the FDA if your 510K has been accepted for substantive review or if it has been placed on refuse to accept hold. Refuse to accept hold or the refuse to accept policy is outlined in the guidance and the link provided on this slide. I recommend that you review that guidance thoroughly. It provides a great checklist so that you can make sure that you're meeting all of the administrative requirements of your 510K. And that's the purpose of the refuse to accept policy, is to make sure that your 510K is administratively complete and that the reviewer can conduct a substantive review. The FDA clock begins on the date receipt of when your 510K is accepted for review. So if your 510K does not pass RTA, the RTA hold, your 510K will be put on hold until you submit the necessary information. By day 60, the FDA will conduct their substantive review. And by day 60, the FDA will communicate with you as to whether or not your 510K is going to proceed through interactive review or they will make an additional information request. So a substantive interaction that they will have with you by day 60, as I mentioned, can be that your 510K will not be placed on hold and the outstanding deficiencies will be resolved via interactive review, or that your 510K will be placed on hold and you will receive a formal additional information request which identifies the outstanding deficiencies that need to be addressed. So let's go into those specifically. So interactive review is an informal interaction between FDA and the submitters during the review of your 510K. Interactive review requests do not stop the FDA clock. So that can be very beneficial because it prevents unnecessary delays, it may reduce the overall time to decision, and it ensures that timely responses from submitters are received. So the reviewer will determine whether or not interactive review is appropriate. Please note, though, that interactive review correspondence is not subject to e-copy requirements unless you submit information that is needed for the interactive review through the Document Control Center. So anything that is submitted to the Document Control Center must have a valid e-copy. Additional information requests are formal requests. Additional information requests are made via email. However, that does not stop the reviewer from contacting the 510K submitter to discuss the deficiencies in detail. However, the reviewer will follow up with a formal email to place that submission on hold. So additional information requests are formal and they are subject to e-copy requirements. Because they are formal, they do stop the FDA clock. So a company or a 510K submitter has up to 180 days to provide a complete response to the AI request to the Document Control Center. It's important that you note that you have 180 days to respond. If you submit your file on day 179 and you do not pass the e-copy requirements, your file may go over 180 days and your 510K may with be withdrawn. So please account for that when you're preparing your response to your additional information. So next, by day 90, FDA should, will hopefully issue a MADUFMA decision on your 510K. MADUFMA 3 performance goals are for a traditional and abbreviated 510K 90 FDA review days, and for a special, it's 30 days. If you do not receive a MADUFA decision by day 90, the FDA will communicate with you via a missed MADUFA decision communication by day 100. And this communication will outline the outstanding review issues with your 510K. So now let's talk about 510K decisions. 510K decisions, you can receive a substantially equivalent decision or a non-substantially equivalent decision. If you receive a substantially equivalent decision, you can then market your product. You have received 510K clearance. 
It's important to note, though, that once you receive 510K clearance, you now have a valid 510K number, and you should complete your establishment registration and device listing. Please refer to the other modules on CRH Learn for additional information on how to comply with registration and listing requirements. If you receive an NSC or a non-substantially equivalent decision, you may have to resubmit another 510K with new data. You may, may be appropriate for you to submit a PMA, a de novo, or a reclassification petition. So why might you receive an NSE decision? The first reason may be that, that you don't identify an appropriate predicate device. So either your predicate device was not legally marketed or it's not appropriate. And it could be that your predicate device has a new intended use compared to your predicate, a new intended use compared to your predicate device. Or you may receive an NSC because the differences in technological characteristics compared to the predicate device do raise questions, different questions regarding safety and effectiveness. You may also receive an NSC decision if you did not demonstrate that your device is at least as safe and as effective as your predicate. So really you want to make sure in your 510K that you go through the substantial equivalence discussion and make sure that you're addressing those decision points within the flowchart. So what happens after a device is cleared? The following are posted on the FDA's public 510K database. Your substantial equivalence determination letter, your indications for use form, and a 510K summary if one is provided or if you have provided the 510K statement instead. Please note, for 510K statement, submitters must make available all information included in their pre-market notification on safety and effectiveness within 30 days of a request by any person. In summary, we have covered a lot of aspects regarding the 510K program during this presentation. We've covered the fact that the appropriate classification for a device will indicate whether or not 510K clearance is required before the device can be legally marketed. We've gone over that the 510K review standard is comparative. Therefore, substantial equivalence must be demonstrated for a new device compared to a legally marketed predicate device. We also covered in depth what type of content should be included in your 510K to demonstrate the safety and effectiveness of, your, of the new device compared to the predicate device. And we went over the timeline for which the FDA will communicate with submitters during the review of their 510Ks. And we talked about 510K decisions and if a 510K is found substantially equivalent, that it can be legally marketed in the United States. This slide provides you with additional resources for obtaining information about medical device regulation, so please refer to them if you need additional assistance. I hope that this presentation has been able to provide you with the fundamentals of the 510K program, and thank you for watching. Thank you for viewing the 510K program presentation. I hope you found it informative. I'm Heather Howe, Deputy Director of CDRH's Office of Communication and Education, and this is Elias Malis, Director of our Division of Industry and Consumer Education. We're joined now by your presenter, Lieutenant Commander Kimberly Piermatio. Thank you, Kim. Also joining us to answer your questions are Ms. Marjorie Shulman, Director of the 510K program in the Office of Device Evaluation and Ms. Fatime Rajan, Policy Analyst from the Office of In Vitro Diagnostics and Radiological Health. Please remember, you can submit questions by clicking the Ask a Question icon, which appears at the top of your screen. You can also call the phone number you see on the screen now to ask your question live. We're available to take your questions until around 11.50 this morning. At that time, we'll conclude this session and at 12 noon, we'll continue with our next segment, which is De Novo program. While we're waiting for your calls, we'll get started with some email questions you've already submitted. The first question is in regards to change of ownership of a 510K. The question is, do I need to submit a new 510K if I purchased a 510K from another company? Marjorie. Yeah, that's a great question. No. Um, 510Ks can be bought and sold, transferred to one another, but if a company both manufactures and distributes a 510K, they need their own. So it can't be a joint ownership or anything like that. Okay. But they can be bought and sold. Great. Let's get to another emailed question. Um, someone wants to know, can I participate in the e-submission program? Okay, so CDRH has a 510K e-submission program. Um, it is a voluntary program, but it's only open to certain divisions. That would be the Division of Cardiovascular, the Division of Physical Medicine, Neurology, Orthopedic, and Surgical Devices. So it's just specific devices. Um, there is a website on the e-submission program, so they can refer to that. Okay, excellent. We'll keep it going. Um, another email question is asking about um, mobile medical apps. 
um, if, a mo if a mobile app is determined to require a 510K application, does a new 510K have to be submitted when new operating system updates are released? If those operating system updates have new features that require modifications to the mobile app? Good question. <laughs> yeah, that's very good. Uh, most likely, yes, because it's a change or modification to an existing device. However, before submitting the 510K, we would suggest they, they check out the mobile medical apps uh, guidance document. And we have an email address for uh, those kind of questions because it might be device specific. So that probably needs a bit more uh, thought to it. Maybe they can get into the weeds on that one. <laughs> okay. Excellent. All right, our next question is about uh, the use of standards. Um, would the use of consensus standards usually be a good justification for submitting an abbreviated 510K rather than a traditional? Yes, so abbreviated 510K um, does rely on the use of consensus standards. So yes, that would be when it's appropriate. Okay. Our next uh, question via email is about product codes. Um, what will prompt the FDA to generate a new three-letter product code? Usually the addition of a new indication for use that we found substantially equivalent to the 510K program or um, a change in technology, we would want to differentiate the, that from the ones that are already cleared. And that will make searching easier for anyone trying to find a predicate. Okay. And how would someone be able to um, find out whether we've generated a new product code? It would be listed on the product code database. Okay. Um, there's not really a list that goes out that says we've created these product codes today. But if they were to, to search um, under the regulation or device name or... or um, that's that favorite database that I referenced in the presentation. <laughs> right. No, that, that's going to come in handy for anyone submitting yeah. a 510K. Okay. And also, they'll, um, it'll appear on a letter, an SE letter, mm -hmm. with a new product code. Correct. Okay. All right. Our next question. When the intended use and scientific technology of a device is the same, however, the detection level of the device has been changed due to a revised worldwide generally accepted standard, um, would, this, would it be acceptable to submit a special 510K? So this is, it appears to be speaking about a diagnostic with a certain detection level. So. Fadme, would you like to take sure. a Sure. So I say, um, so I say, based on the information that we have now and that's limited, I say a special sounds appropriate. So I say, submit your special 510K, and we'll take a, a close look at it. And if need be, we can always convert it to a traditional. Okay. Okay. I let's. Uh, we actually have a caller. So let's take our next question from the phone. So caller, what is your question? Are you speaking to me? Yes. Okay, my question is specific to IVDs and it's the 510K process. When a product is not going to be used outside of the laboratory that's submitting the 510K, why does the FDA require labeling that will never be seen or used by anybody? And then there's a, uh, a an additional question on that, specifically to UDIs. When a product is not going to be shipped, this would be a laboratory developed product and 510Ks that are only for laboratory. Why would you have a UDI for a product that's not going to be used so this outside of the lab? No labeling will ever leave the lab. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, question. It's a good question, but it's a specific question for the LDT team. Um, so I recommend sending an email to dice at fda.hhs.gov, and we will direct that question to the appropriate people. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're ready to go back to another emailed question. Is a foreign manufacturer required to register their manufacturing site prior to submitting a 510K? Uh, no one's required to uh, register prior to submitting a 510K. That's only required after the 510K clearance. Right. So that doesn't matter if it's foreign or domestic. Right. Within 30 days of beginning manufacturing, the company should register with the FDA. Okay, and whether they're foreign or domestic. Right, foreign or domestic. Okay. Okay. Let's. Uh, we actually have another caller. Um, let's take the next call question from the phone. Caller, what is your question? Caller, uh, I think your line is open. We may have lost our caller. Let's okay. go back to the. Oh. Hello. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Aww. Call back. We'll take your question. <laughs> All right, we'll continue with another emailed question. Thanks for sending those in. 
when submitting a 510K is a requirement to submit an original paper and two um, copies, one paper and one e-copy, or just two submissions, one paper and one e-copy. You're required to submit one e-copy and one paper copy. Okay, so just two submissions. Just two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excellent. Um, the next emailed question. Um, please speak a little bit more regarding the difference between multiple predicate devices and split predicate devices in a pre-market submission. Very interesting question. Yes. Go ahead. You can. Okay. <laughs> um, so multiple predicates have always been allowed and are allowed still in the 510K program. It's just uh, you need one uh, main predicate that gets you all the way through the flow chart. The split predicate was only if the uh, device would, be, would have been NSE at intended use, and then you're bringing in another one for technology. Technically, that was never really allowed uh, in the past. So the change with the 510K program guidance did not change our existing uh, policies. But multiple predicates, uh, as long as you have one that can get you all the way through the flow chart, you're fine. And then you're going to bring in others to show um, maybe uh, like reference devices to show uh, technology or maybe uh, material that we've seen before on the device to, to further strengthen the substantially equivalent uh, decision. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to add that they, if they use multiple predicates, they have to identify the primary predicate. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, our next question is about review cycles. How many rounds of AI or additional information requests are allowed for a single 510K submission? Is the sponsor allowed two rounds of questions or three or some other number? Are there any statutory limits? That's a great question. There is no statutory limits to how many cycles. However, we do have the shared goal uh, for Medufo of total time. So for an RTA, that can go as many rounds as needed to, uh, to before it's officially accepted. And then after that, um, we usually go on hold once, and then we'll work interactively with you to uh, meet the 90 days FDA total time. OK. OK. Um the next question is about the review timeline and interactions during the review. Um, does FDA have to reply by day 60 for the substantive review? And what happens if they or we don't reply? <laughs> so the answer to that is we don't have to, uh, but okay. we do try. It's a goal. It's, it's a goal. It's a Medufa goal, and we do report on how many uh, AIs were done by day 60. So it's definitely a number that, that we let people know. Uh, how many we do, and, and we definitely try to meet it. And so far, for all our Medufa goals, we are meeting that goal. Um, but nothing okay. happens if we don't, if it could come at day 70. or. And I think people would agree that if we need a couple more days to make it a complete letter, then it's better to have all the deficiencies than to, uh, to rush by some date. Okay. And it's also important to remember all communication is done for 510Ks via email now. So we really want to make sure that the reviewers um, have the correct contact information for the submitters. So that's very important. Good point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kim. Marge. All right. Um, the next question is about uh, comparison and predicate devices. Um, in doing comparisons to predicate devices, will the information in the predicate 510K summary um, be sufficient for showing substantial equivalence? Or does the sponsor need to obtain and make measurements from the predicate device? Okay, so I think, I mean, yeah. this question is very common. So I think um, a lot of people think they have to do side-by-side -side performance testing with their predicate device. That's not necessarily, um, they have to do that. It, you know, it is encouraged if they're able to. I think you want to make sure that when you're making your substantial equivalence discussion that you do a comparison of the specifications to make sure that the products, um, you're comparing, you know, um, one of the predicate versus the other. So you may have to go in and look past the 510K summary for the predicate device, such as labeling or marketing claims, things like that. And I think it's pretty device specific too. Right. Uh, for some, the summary is not going to give you enough information because the summary is still void of any confidential or commercial uh, confidential information in it. So that may not be enough uh, for what you need. If there's a guidance document, that's probably going to tell you more ranges or anything. Mm -hmm. okay. And, I, and I, I also like to add, if you know that you need performance data, 
but you're not sure about what type or you need uh, to have a specific comments from FDA, definitely come in with a pre-submission and there's a guidance document on that uh, where we can actually answer your specific questions about that specific right. performance. Okay, great. Um, the next emailed question, what is the import process for a 510K cleared device? So in order to import your product legally in the United States, you would first have to make sure that you're registered, your, your establishment is registered and your device is listed. And in order to actually list your product, you must have um, a valid 510K clearance number. So you won't be able to complete your registration and listing unless you have a valid 510K clearance. So if they're importing their product, they would need to um, obtain the 510K clearance and then register and list appropriately. Mm -hmm. Unless it's exempt, they just need the product code, right? Correct, unless it's exempt, 510K exempt. Okay. Okay, we have a caller. So I'd like to take the question from the phone. Caller, what is your question? Um, your line is open, caller. I'm sorry, we're having technical difficulties <laughs> with the line. Hello? Okay, Hello. okay. Caller, what is your question? My question is, uh, what percent of 510Ks have new technological characteristics, and what percent of 510Ks uh, contain clinical data or are required to have clinical data? That's a good question. I'll take the second part <laughs> first. <laughs> About 10 to 15 percent require clinical data. Um, what percentage have new technological characteristics? I don't know offhand. Um, I, I don't know. We would have to further look into it. I'm not even sure we track that in the database versus how many are new indications versus uh, new technology. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. what, I'm sorry. What? So, and I was wondering if they, if they tend to be the same devices, one that has a new technological characteristic also required to have clinical data. Clinical data is required in a 510K when there's a, a significant difference with that in the predicate. So the new technology uh, could fall into that category of a significant difference between that and the predicate device. Um, that's probably the reasons for clinical data most of the time or a new indication for use. So th those are, but not all the time because, again, only 10 to 15 percent of 510Ks need clinical data. And also mm -hmm. sometimes um, animal data might be sufficient and clinical data might not be as necessary. Right. Right. Was that all your questions, okay. caller? Okay. Let's take another. Okay. Back to the emails. We have a 510K cleared, registered, and listed device. What approach should a private label manufacturer take in order to list the same device under their own name? Okay. So for... Um, I think it's important to understand the difference between a private label and a relabeler. Um, for a private labeler, they're not required to submit a new 510K because on the private label you must have a statement that indicates the relationship between the um, private label and the registered establishment. So the FDA wouldn't necessarily issue a new 510K or Actually, if you wanted to submit a new 510K and, and, and pay the user fee and go through the process to get your own 510K clearance letter, you could. Um, but the FDA doesn't necessarily just give 510K clearances to private labelers. Okay. So, I think that was mm -hmm. a question. Okay. Yeah. Margie, did you have something yeah. to add to that? No. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, our next question is about uh, Class two devices that are exempt. Some Class two products are now exempt from 510K, which were required to have a 510K. Um, for this, I think it means it, previously it was a Class two device requiring a 510K. Now that product area is exempt. Explain how these products will be reviewed to determine if they still comply with FDA requirements. For example, if you make a material change to these now exempt Class two products, is testing required? So there are several pieces to this question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an excellent question, too. So, so really, it's the same as any exempt device, even a Class 1. So if they make a significant change that would, what we call trip the limitations, then that would require a new 510K. At this point, if we find it substantially equivalent to that exempt device, the first one is found substantially equivalent, and ones after that would be exempt. So that's how the regulations kind of grow over time and, and, and expand with, with time. Mm -hmm. So it really is the... Uh, more of a change and modification question. 
is this change significant enough to require a new 510K? Okay. Thank you, Marjorie. So this next question is about clinical evidence. Um, are clinical data generated from clinical investigations conducted in the EU acceptable as clinical data or evidence, or must the trials occur in the United States? Now, for this question, I think we were relating it to um, submission of a 510K. The answer is yes, um, it is acceptable. Um, sometimes, depending on what the device is and what the device specifics are, uh, we might need usability study that are from English-speaking um, countries. Um, so I say in general, yes, but there is a caveat to that. Okay. And then a f sort of follow-up question about more on clinical evidence. Can and may retrospective clinical data be used for a 510K submission? Or does any clinical data need to be specifically designed for use of a specific product? So these are two questions, and I think they're a little different. I think the first is, um, can a 510K include retrospectively collected evidence? I say um, it depends. It depends on the device area and what the specific device is. So it's kind of difficult to answer this, qu mm -hmm. this question broadly without knowing what the specific device is. Yeah, we can okay. say it's not a definite no, but that's probably one that you would want to come in and discuss with the reviewing division and in some kind of uh, pre-submission. It may be a pre yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the part B of this was, or um, may clinical data, um, must the clinical data be designed specifically for use of a specific product? I think this is asking, uh, uh, is it possible to extrapolate from another product uh, to support a 510K for a different device? I think that depends too. Yeah, it depends. Right. It's yeah. the same answer, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So pre-submission would be the appropriate route to find out the, the answer to that question. Okay, excellent. Um, one more on clinical evidence. <laughs> um, while submitting a 510K um, application, do we require clinical data or could preclinical data be used to claim substantial equivalence? So I think, Fatima, you talked a little bit about this. Um, maybe you can... Uh, um, expand on that? Sure. Uh, the answer is, again, it depends. Mm -hmm. it's, it looks like it's our favorite answer <laughs> of the day. <laughs> um, it's, the reason I say that is because we need to know what the specific device is. Yes, in mm -hmm. some cases we can have preclinical. It's animal data, for example, or some bench testing could be sufficient. Uh, to demonstrate substantial equivalence, and in some cases it might not be. So the best thing to do, and my recommendation, is to come in with a pre-submission, yes. and you can get uh, those questions specifically answered for your specific device. And I know it sounds a lot like we're saying pre-submission, but it really is going to be helpful in the long run because yeah. it doesn't send you down the wrong path, and you know exactly what, what we're looking for and, and uh, what, what needs to be done. Right. So. And it really can save time down the road if someone knows um, they need to gather evidence or don't need to get, gather evidence. Right, right. Sure. Okay, um, the next question. Can you explain again the main differences between special and abbreviated 510Ks? Mm -hmm. So an abbreviated 510K um, relies on the use of consensus standards, guid like guidance documents, and um, things that are very sort of clear on what's expected for that device versus a special is typically um, for a manufacturer who has a legally marketed device already, so they have a 510K clearance, and they want to make a modification to their 510K. So then they would submit a special because they're not changing necessarily the fundamental scientific technology, and no performance data is needed to really assess that modification. So, uh, right, uh, um, exactly right. Mm -hmm. but, and, and, but they also, for a special, can't change the indication for right. use. Yeah. Okay. And um, we may need uh, some data, mm -hmm. however, it would be in the form of a risk analysis right. uh, format. So it would have to have uh, acceptance criteria or something that we mm -hmm. could. So you, you're not submitting the underlying data. Right. Uh, Thank you, Marjorie. Mm -hmm. um, this next question is with respect to um, use of multiple devices for the substantial equivalence process and comparison. So the, the emailer is asking, so to clarify further, may one not show partial substantial equivalence to one device and partially to another? So that's the question. I, I think that's what we meant by a split predicate. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not really in the spirit of the 510K program. Um, the, the guidance document uh, has many examples in it, too, because mm -hmm. sometimes for, like, a multi-perimeter monitor, you're going to have different devices that are coming together. So, of course, you're going to have 
the, the blood pressure cuff and the, and the pulse oximeter and all. So in those kind of cases, um, you, you can have one predicate that has all of those, yes. but you're going to probably use different uh, devices to show equivalence. But overall, uh, you do need one to get all the way through. All the way through the flow chart. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Correct. Excellent. Okay, the next question. Does a 510K need to be submitted if the same product, so there no, there's no changes to the medical device, will change from one manufacturing location to another? So if the manufacturing site is just changing, then... Is, that's okay, the so question. the question is, if the manufacturing site is just changing, then you don't need to submit a new 510K, but the new manufacturing site would have to register their establishment okay. as a new manufacturing site, and they would have to make sure that they are, of course, manufacturing the product according to the 510K specifications as it was cleared. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the Part B to this question is, so in this case, the, the previous manufacturing location will still produce some of the volume, some of the medical devices, and import from the second manufacturing location location. So given that now. So then both manufacturing sites would have to be registered. Okay. So it's just a matter of if the other, if the previous site was no longer manufacturing, they would basically deactivate their registration. But if they're going to continue on, then they would both be registered. Okay. We have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. Quick question. A quick question. No <laughs> pressure. Um, <laughs> upon receipt of the first set of AI deficiencies or interactive review questions, are subsequent sets of questions limited to the topics and areas identified as deficiencies from the first set of questions and deficiencies? Or can new topics or areas be, be questioned? Hopefully, new topics will not be brought up unless the response to the first question raised another question in it. So, um, I can't think of an example because time. No. Um, <laughs> uh, that, uh, um, it, the first set of questions should be a complete set of questions. But if those answers uh, bring up new questions, then yes, they can be asked. Sure. Okay. So thank you, Marjorie. I'm sorry to say it, but we are out of time. Uh, thank you, panelists. If we didn't get to your questions today, please be sure to send it to dice at fda.hhs.gov. The slides for today's presentation will be available on CDRH Learn by Friday of this week and the video segment should be available in about two weeks. Thank you all for your participation and for your thoughtful questions. This conclu concludes this portion of our CDRH Industry Basics Workshop. Please stay tuned for our next presentation on the DeNovo program, which will be begin at 12 noon. Also, please provide your feedback by completing the survey, which is provided on our website at www.fda.gov backslash CDRH webinar. See you in just a little while.
Welcome to the DeNovo program. My name is Elias Malice, Director of the Division of Industry and Consumer Education at FDA's Center for Devices and Radiological Health. For this session, we'll review the basics of the DeNovo program. During the course of this presentation, we'll cover several learning objectives. First, you'll learn to be able to describe the legal and regulatory basis for the DeNovo program. Next, we'll review and describe the DeNovo submission process. Next, we'll assemble the materials that will lead to a good quality DeNovo submission. And finally, you'll learn to be able to identify the resources useful in preparing a DeNovo application. So to frame this conversation, let's start with a definition. What is a DeNovo? It's a classification process. It uses a risk-based strategy. It applies to new novel devices whose type has previously not been classified. It's for devices that would otherwise be classified into class three and provides a means to classify into class one or two. For a de novo, it is an application sent to FDA by a medical device sponsor. If the de novo is granted, it establishes a new device type along with a new classification, regulation, necessary controls, and product code. If a de novo is granted, the device is eligible to serve as a predicate for new medical devices where appropriate within the 510K process. So to understand the de novo program, it's, un, it's important to go back to the beginning of the medical device regulations, and that would be 1976 with the enactment of the medical device amendments. Two major activities occurred during this time. First, we refer to Section 513 of the FDNC Act. It, within this act, we describe the classification of medical devices according to the level of risk. It's a risk-based approach, and we have class one, two, and three levels of risk. Class one applies to general controls. Class two refers to general and special controls. And for class three, these are reserved for general and pre-market approval controls. A reference for regulatory controls may be available at this website. So during this time, all medical devices that were known to exist at that time were classified into class one, two, or three. For class three, again, these are devices that require pre-market approval, and these were reserved for the devices with the highest level of risk. This was reserved for devices where we were unable to rely on general and or special controls in order to regulate them under a lower classification. So once we classified all devices that were known at that time, we also have new devices that may be developed over, over the course of regulations of history. This pertains to section 513F1. This is reserved for post-amendment class three medical devices. So for a new device that was not in place at the time of the medical device amendments, this was a new device. And it refers to devices not equivalent to class one or two devices. These were automatically classified into class three, regardless of the level of risk for that product. So with the DeNovo program, this attempted to fill a gap within um, the automatic classification of devices into class three. So as a result, Section 513F2 was established and enacted in 1997 under the Food and Drug Administration Modernization Act. Section 513F2 established the de novo classification process. This is also known as the Evaluation of Automatic Class Redesignation. This provided FDA with the regulatory authority to classify devices that were automatically classified into Class 3 per Section 513F1. Again, these are new devices. It provided FDA with the ability to classify into class one or two using the criteria of section 513A1, A and B. So it's important to note that this excludes devices that were already classified into class three, both those at the time of 1976 um, medical device amendments, as well as devices that were eventually classified into class three. In brief, the de novo process as of the 1997 law was a four-step process. The first step was that the sponsor would submit a 510K or a pre-market notification. Next, FDA would issue a final 510K decision of not substantially equivalent due to no predicate. Next, the sponsor then submits the de novo request. And finally, the last step, FDA decides whether to classify the device from class three to either class one or two with a new classification and regulation. In 2012, we made further modifications to the de novo program. 
This was done under the Food and Drug Administration Safety and Innovation Act, or FIDESIA. So what changed was the ability to allow a sponsor to not submit a 5K prior to the de novo request. In addition, the time frame for review of a de novo was established at 120 FDA days. The purpose of this was to help streamline and increase the efficiency of the de novo process. So what didn't change was that de novo only applied to devices that were considered new devices. That is, those devices that would be classified under Section 513F1 of the FDNC Act. Sponsors still had the opportunity and option to submit a 510K first. That was the option under FDAMA from 1997. And importantly, the intent and decision-making threshold for de novo was unchanged. So in 2012, the de novo process was more streamlined, and it was a two-step process. The first step is that the sponsor may, may submit the de novo request directly, and the second step is that FDA would then decide whether to classify the device from class three to class two or one with a new classification and regulation. We have several resources that describe these processes. After the passage of FDAMA, the FDA issued a de novo guidance in 1998, and this describes the de novo process since that time. Now, what's important to note is that due to the enactment of FDASIA of 2012, some aspects of this guidance may longer be current. More recently, after the passage of FDASIA, we've issued the 2014 de novo guidance and draft. Now, here on this slide, we have links to both of these guidances. For this 2014 de novo draft guidance, this was published on August 14th of this year. This reflects the proposed policy and procedures to implement the changes to the de novo program from FIDESIA of 2012. Now, keep in mind, because this is a draft guidance, it's not to be implemented at this time. If finalized, it will replace the 1998 guidance. And there is a 90-day public comment period for review and comment of the draft guidance. So what are the major items of the draft guidance of 2014? Well, this guidance explains the changes to FIDESIA and the FDNC Act, specifically to allow the alternate pathway that does not require the submission of a 510K prior to the de novo request. Again, the time frame for review was established for 120 FDA days. We now describe the decision options for de novo. We either grant the de novo or decline the de novo. The guidance describes and goes into some detail of the pre-submission meeting process. And we introduce a new term. So for a de novo that is not preceded by 510K, we refer to this as the direct de novo. So let's, uh, let's go through the de novo submission process. As a result of both the original law and the modified law of FDASIA of 2012, we now have two pathways available. I'll refer to them as pathway one for 510K, then de novo, or pathway two, or the direct de novo. So for pathway one, we start with the 510K, then the de novo. The best means to use this is when you believe you have a suitable predicate for your device. So you have a new device, you believe you have a viable predicate, this is the option to consider using. So the first step is that you submit your 510K submission. Keep in mind, this should be a comprehensive, complete 510K submission. This is where you're doing your best job to demonstrate substantial equivalence to the predicate device that you believe is appropriate for your new device. The next step is that FDA reviews the 510K submission. Now, in this case, FDA will make the NSC decision, not substantially equivalent decision, due to the lack of predicate. Now, by lack of predicate, what we mean is that the proposed predicate device that you proposed does not have the same intended use and technological characteristics as your new device. As a result, FDA is issuing an NSC decision. Now, in the NSC letter that you may receive, if FDA believes we uh, believe that your product is a de novo candidate, we will indicate that in the NSC letter. Now, keep in mind, this is based on the risk-benefit profile, not adequacy of the evidence or data that you had submitted in your 510K. The, sub the suggestion for de novo is not binding by FDA, and conversely, if we don't include this suggestion in your NSC letter, you still have the opportunity to pursue a de novo if you believe you qualify. So once you've received an NSC, you then may follow up with the de novo application. It would be important to reference the prior 510K submission that you had submitted prior to this de novo. In this de novo application, 
you would also provide additional evidence to demonstrate the safety and effectiveness of the new device as appropriate. And importantly, if there are any differences between the 510K device and that of the de novo, you would want to characterize those differences and evidence gaps that may warrant additional testing and safety and effectiveness information to support your de novo. Within your de novo application, there are several key things that you would be also be doing regarding characterizing the device and the risk to health. So the, the first step is to characterize the risk to health associated with the use of the new device. You then would characterize how those risks may be mitigated. Next, you'd provide a rationale for why the device does not fit into any existing regulation. And if you propose class two classification, we would also describe the special controls to mitigate the risk to health. I referred to special controls earlier in this presentation. And finally, FDA will then review the de novo application. During the review, we may interact with you and ask for additional information to clarify your device and, and perhaps additional testing. And ultimately, we'll render a final de novo decision. We will either grant the de novo or decline the de novo. This is pathway one, 510K, then de novo. Now, you have another option, pathway number two, the direct de novo. Now, when to use this makes most sense if you believe you don't have a suitable predicate device, either through your own evaluation or assessment or through FDA feedback, and you believe the device may be classified into class one or two per the de novo process. So again, direct de novo is characterizing this. So in this case, the first step is that you submit your de novo application. In this application, you would provide the evidence that establishes reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness of the new device. This will typically include the information you would have submitted in a traditional 510K submission, such as the device description, the labeling, and performance testing, which may be bench, animal, and or clinical evidence. And then you go through the classification information in which you would characterize the risk to health associated with the new device, characterizing how the risks may be mitigated, providing the rationale for why the device does not ex fit to an existing regulation, either 510K or PMA, and again, if you propose class two classification, then identifying those special controls to mitigate the risk to health. Step two is that FDA reviews the de novo application, and again, we will either grant the de novo or decline it. This elaborate flow chart is included in the draft guidance, the 2014 draft de novo guidance, and it, it illustrates the new proposed pathway for the de novo. I'd referred to earlier regarding getting feedback from the FDA, and this is a very important slide I encourage you to, to really take uh, into consideration, that we inc strongly encourage that you use a pre-submission program if you have a de novo candidate. Um, importantly, it would be appropriate to use this after you've finalized and established your device design and intended use. The reason for this is that both of those factors may influence whether or not your, your product is de novo eligible. In addition, it would be strongly encouraged to meet after sufficient information has been collected regarding the safety and effectiveness of your device because you will have better established your test methods for your product. And again, if you have a, a novel device with no FDA regulatory history, based on your research, again, this is a good de novo candidate. This is a good reason to have a pre-submission meeting with the FDA to get some feedback. The pre-submission program guidance is referred to here in this link. So after the de novo process, what happens after a de novo is granted? Well, several things occur. So first, the new device is now legally marketed. Now, it's subject to all of the appropriate post-market requirements that are applicable to that device and class, including general controls and special controls if they were enacted and applicable to that device. In addition, that new device will establish a new classification regulation. That new device is then eligible to serve as a predicate for future similar devices, which would then follow the standard 5 to k process. FDA does several things as well. First, we will publish an order that announces a new classification and controls. And in addition, we will generate a decision summary that is publicly available. Now, for those of you familiar with PMAs, this is somewhat similar to the summary of safety and effectiveness data that is available after a PMA is approved. Here I'm showing a screen of one of our websites which would be very useful for you to consider in doing your research. This is found on our FDA transparency website, and this is the homepage of the de novo summaries that are housed. 
Here is the link to that page, that home page. Now here, if we drill down further, we can see that here we've listed the device names, the file number, and in this third column we have the classification order, uh, which is the official um, decision for uh, FDA granting the de novo, and in the rightmost column is the, the decision summary, and this is FDA's explanation for the de novo that was granted. Here I have some examples. So here are, is page one and three of a sample classification order. And as you can see here, we list here the new regulation number. We also list the new regulation name and the regulation class. Here it's class two. Um, on the bottom left here, we also have a description of the new device. On page three, we have the discussion regarding the risk and how those risks were mitigated. And you will see this for every de novo uh, that's granted and in the order itself. Here's a sample of the first two pages of the FDA decision summary. This follows a somewhat standard template in which we describe the device that we've reviewed, the indications and intended use that was proposed and granted, and then we go into the detail of the review of the evidence and the classification decision made. These are great resources if you are looking at a candidate de novo and wish to look for some examples of de novos that have been granted and what was accepted by the FDA. It's a great resource. Starting in August of 2014, we've established a de novo database. Here is the screenshot for that. And here we've listed all of the, the de novos that have been granted since the beginning of the program in 1997. The left column here is the device name. The second column here to the left is a requester. Then we have the two columns in the middle, the de novo number, which I'll get to in a second, and the 510K number. Now you'll note that some of these 510K numbers are blank, and I will explain that in a second. And finally here you have the de decision date. So this is a comprehensive listing of all the de novos that have been granted since the uh, beginning of the program. This is a, a relatively new database that was started in August. It's a wonderful resource. And here's a link to that database. So let's discuss this now. For de novos, we now have a submission identification unique ID. Here is the example. The first three letters are DEN, and that refers to de novo. The next two characters are going to be two numbers, and this will be the year of the submission. So for 2014, those numbers will be 1-4. The last four characters that are noted by the Z are numbers, and these will be the submission increments that start from 0001 upward. Now, it's important to know that this naming structure was effective with new submissions as of August 2014. So for 510Ks that lead to a de novo, they'll have both a 510K number and the DEN, DEN number. For direct de novos, they won't have a 510K number. So as I showed in that prior pre, um, slide, there were some de novos that had only the DEN number and no 510K. Those are direct de novos. And so that will be a clue to you that there was no 510K before. Now, we went retrospectively for all de novos that had been granted, and so we've gone through, again, the history of the program and retroactively assigned DEN IDs to the prior de novos. They will also sustain the 510K numbers that they, they were included with. So now let's switch gears and talk about the suggested information that would be recommended for inclusion in your de novo application. The caveat here is that the content you'll see next in the next few slides is directly pulled from the 2014 draft guidance. This, the disclaimer for draft guidance is, is that it's not to be implemented at this time. However, the information, especially for this information, may be useful for consideration and inclusion in your submission. So while it's not required or officially for implementation, it has a lot of good useful information that you should consider in the inclusion of your de novo application. So let's go through this in some detail. So the first section is the information that informs who you are and how we contact you. You would include your applicant name, the contact name, your address, and information such as your phone, fax, and email. Next, uh, in the de novo, it's recommended to include the regulatory history. Now this would be the regulatory history that you had with FDA on this same device. It's possible you had a prior 510K and a related NSE decision, or potentially clinical evidence was collected under an IDE. You may have also had a pre-submission or pre-sub with the FDA on this, or possibly this was a previously withdrawn or declined de novo. So 
If this applies to you, any of these items, it's, it would be very useful and important to describe this within your Genova application. It helps provide the context of what we're talking about. Next, we get into the device itself. So here you would describe your device, provide device description, very clearly state the intended use or indications for use statement. Describe the device in terms of its technological characteristics and the labeling. Next, this is where we talk about the classification summary. This is very important for you in step four. This is where you will have done your research to inform FDA of how you believe that your device is truly a new device. And what that means is through your review of FDA classifications and existing regulations, as well as approved PMAs, this is your way of indicating that you believe truly this is a new device that FDA has not previously classified. Again, this is going back to Section 513F1 of the FDNC Act. Again, this is a very important section. So if your device was approved under a PMA or previously cleared under 510K, you're not eligible for the de novo. In step five, once you've established in your, um, in your submission that you believe you're truly a new device, you then inform us how you believe we should regulate this. So you would provide your, recommend, your recommended classification, either class one or two. The device could be exempt or not exempt. This would be, again, your recommendation. And finally, your justification for the recommended classification, the controls, and if you propose that it be exempt, your explanation for why it should be an exempt device. If you are proposing that your new device be classified into class two, we'd also ask that you identify the proposed special controls with which your device would comply. In section seven, this is where you would provide your evidence, your safety and effectiveness evidence that supports your product. So with this evidence, this includes the methods, data, and results of your product. The testing may include preclinical evidence, or it may also include animal evidence, clinical testing, whatever is warranted to support the safety and effectiveness of your new device. You would correlate the evidence that you've collected with the recommended classification for your device and controls. Now this slide talks about the actual spirit of the classification and characterization of the risks and mitigation of those risks. So this is part of the de novo process where you are trying to justify why the device may be appropriately reclassified into class one or two, and you're able to characterize those risks. So these three sections describe that. In section 11, we go into the benefit risk considerations. This is your opportunity to describe the how the benefits with recommended general and special controls outweigh the risk of the device for the class that you've identified. Section 12 is the device labeling, which would comply with Section 201M of the FDNC Act. So now that we've gone through the de novo submission content, um, let's sw uh, switch gears and discuss what are some of the best practices and helpful hints that will help you facilitate the de novo process and lead to a good quality submission. The first thing is do your homework. Specifically, do your homework with the regulatory research to show that your new device is truly eligible for a de novo. Again, this is where you would verify that your new device is not already classified by FDA. If we've already classified your device, it is not eligible for the de novo program. Research everything in our all available data databases, including the 510K, PMA, and classification databases, as well as the de novo databases in order to um, fully understand FDA's prior decisions on devices we've classified. This is a very important step and helpful hint if you pursue direct de novo and especially if you don't obtain FDA feedback prior to doing so. The next helpful hint, be specific with and finalize the device description and intended use of your new device. This is very important because these key components will inform whether or not the new device has a legitimate predicate to which it may be compared. So if you change this from uh, over time, then it is important to know the predicate device that you've established and whether or not it will land on the de novo pathway. The third helpful hint, complete all the required performance testing prior to submission of the de novo. Your de novo application should be your best effort to include all of the comprehensive and necessary information for FDA, FDA to make the final de novo decision. Again, this would be all of your evidence, which may include bench, animal, in vivo, in vitro, and or clinical evidence. Each de novo will need the level of testing to characterize the level of risk of the device, to demonstrate reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness of that device, 
and the appropriateness of the controls that you've, you've cited. Now, it's important to note that clinical evidence may not always be required for a de novo submission, but it is likely in many cases. The fourth helpful hint, ensure that the data do support the proposed intended use. If you propose an intended use for multiple patient populations, for example, provide evidence for all of those groups. If you only provide evidence for one of the patient populations, then we'd expect you to provide a justification for why you did not directly test those other patient subgroups. Correlate each risk to health with a mitigation. To do this, it's recommended you consider similarities of new device risk with mitigation used for other devices. This is where looking at precedent we've established with other de novos may be helpful. So look at special controls granted for other de novos. This is where going to the database, looking at other uh, de novo orders, as well as our FDA summaries of de novos. These are all great resources for you to consider. Take advantage of them. You should address each risk to health with at least one mitigation. Now, being low risk helps support the eligibility for a de novo, but that isn't enough to be granted a de novo. It's very likely that a low risk device will be more likely to be considered de novo, but you have to still be able to uh, characterize the risk to health and provide reproducible controls to manage those risks. So as we recap, you probably are thinking about this presentation and maybe left with the overarching question, does my device qualify for a de novo? Well, let's walk through that. So the first is, has the device type already been classified by FDA? Now, by device type, this again couples both the intended use and technological characteristics of your new device. Through the 5 k pathway, we'd ask, is there an applicable predicate device? Through the PMA pathway, we would ask, has the device type been approved by under a PMA? If the answer is yes, then you are not eligible for de novo. The next is the factors to consider for the new device. Does the device present low risk or moderate risk? Can we identify the risk to health associated with the new device? Can we identify the necessary controls, general and or special, to mitigate those risks? If you answer yes to each of these questions, then there's a good chance you may be eligible for the de novo program. So let's recap. The de novo program provides a means for a new medical device to get to market. Next, the eligibility for de novo is based on several factors, such as FDA precedent, level of risk, and the ability to characterize and mitigate risks of the device. Third, the information needed in a de novo includes evidence that both demonstrate safety, the safety and effectiveness of the new device, as well as the ability to classify the device and the device type. And finally, there are several key resources, such as the FDA pre-submissions program and public domain information on our website that may be useful for you as you're pursuing the de novo. The FDA provides industry education in the form of several different ways. The first is through CDRH Learn, which is a multimedia industry education platform where we have over 80 modules of videos, audio recordings, and PowerPoint presentations that are available to you. We also have Device Advice, which is a text-based educational resource with a wide range of pages that provides comprehensive regulatory information on pre-market and post-market topics. And I have links for both of these resources for here on this slide. And finally, the third and perhaps the most significant is our division itself, the Division of Industry and Consumer Education. If you have a question, you can email us at the address listed here on this slide or contact us by phone. Our homepage on the web is here listed on the link. Thanks for watching. Thank you for viewing the DeNovo presentation, and I hope you found it informative. I'm Heather Howe, Deputy Director of CDRH's Office of Communication and Education, and I'm joined now by your presenter, Elias Malice. Thank you, Elias. Also joining us to help respond to your questions are Dr. Joni Foy, Deputy Director for Engineering and Science Review in CDRH's Office of Device Evaluation, and Mr. Scott McFarland, Associate Director, Regulatory Counsel in CDRH's Office of In Vitro Diagnostics and Radiological Health, or OIR. Please remember, you can submit questions by clicking the Ask a Question icon, which appears at the top of your screen. You can also call the phone number you see on the screen now. 
to ask your question live. Right before 1 o'clock, we'll conclude this session and break for an hour, and then we'll return at 2 with our next segment, Corrective and Preventive Actions, or CAPA. While we're waiting for your calls, we've already received some email questions. The first question is about the timing of a de novo, and I'll turn this over to Joni. What happens if a similar device gets onto the market while my de novo is under review? So thanks, Elias. In the event that a product actually ends up being cleared or approved through the PMA program while you have a de novo that's under actual review, then we would alert the company that has the submission that's currently under active review and notify them of perhaps a new submission that has been cleared through the 510K program because that would set up a new predicate uh, or a product that has been approved through the PMA because then the company would need to come in with a PMA submission. Excellent. All right, our next emailed question. I'm not sure what my special controls will be. How can I decide what special controls will apply to my device? So maybe, Scott, you take this one. Sure. So uh, what I would recommend is that, that you go through a risk analysis. You look at the types of risks that are, seem to apply to your device. And um, I would suggest looking at some of the old de novos that we've done to look at, get an idea for the types of special controls we found appropriate in the past. Um, but that certainly doesn't limit your creativity. If you think that your, your risk situation is novel, then perhaps a, a novel special control might be appropriate. And certainly, um, if you think you can come up with one, we, we would definitely invite any suggestions. Okay. And just to, just to add on to what Scott was saying, additionally, you know, you can certainly take advantage of the pre-submission program to get some additional feedback on the appropriateness of your product being eligible for de novo, as well as sort of the high over-level, overarching issues with regard to whether or not you think the special controls may or may not be appropriate. Excellent. And we actually got a question about the pre-sub. So um, the emailer um, writes, you recommend the pre-sub path in a number of areas. Um, there are fees associated with the precept, correct? If so, where do I find a listing of these fees? So there are actually no fees associated with pre-submissions um, at all. Okay. And is there a fee for de novo? Currently, no. There's no fee associated with the de novo. Okay. If you do a direct de novo submission, correct. if you follow the original de novo pathway, there would be a fee associated with the 510K phase of, of the original pathway. Okay. So once um, you submitted the 510K and then... If you're winding up um, it, submitting a de novo at that point, you, there's no more fees. But that's correct. correct. Okay. Let's get to another emailed question. Um, this one asks about uh, the differences between a de novo submission and a 513G submission. So, Joni? Sure. So, a de novo submission is where you're actually trying to get your product on the market. Um, the 513G is where you're seeking the appropriate classification for a product. There is a fee associated with a 513G currently, but you're going to be getting very high-level feedback with regard to whether or not you currently fit within a current classification regulation, um, be that Class 2, Class 1, or even if it's a PMA product. And, and just to be clear, a 513G wouldn't be a, a classification. It's, it's purely information. Correct. Okay. Um, the next question if a device, if the if the device has the same intended use and shares one technology characteristic with a predicate, yet adds one new technology characteristic as part of the innovation process for this new medical device, may this device go through the traditional 510K uh, pathway, or um, is it eligible for the de novo program? So I think there are a lot of nuances in that question, and so I'm going to essentially say that it's going to depend upon what is the add-on feature, perhaps, that they are considering adding to their product. In that particular situation, I would strongly encourage that the company actually come in and have a pre-sub submission and have uh, some active discussion with the respective division to get some additional insight. Okay. I would agree with that. So I think collaboration is the key here. So speaking of the pre-submissions, um, is the pre-submission for de novo confidential that allows unbiased treatment of the final submission? So I would clarify here that uh, information shared during the pre-submission process is considered during our review. Um, it's certainly not a, a separate process, but uh, it's an opportunity to, to discuss the, the issues relevant to your product. Uh, usually it's focused on the protocols that you're, you're looking at, at uh, studying with your device to demonstrate safety and effectiveness. So we'd still be looking at the same protocols when you bring in the, the supporting data 
appropriate with your de novo submission. Right. And just as an add-on, I think, you know, the purpose of the pre-sub is really to provide very high-level feedback, whereas in, when you actually have come in with the de novo submission itself, we're going to be looking at the data. And so, you know, the data may raise additional issues that mm -hmm. warrant additional discussion. The other thing is, in the event that we have had a pre-sub uh, submission that is directly relevant to your product, we are going to be looking at that prior feedback that we provided. And, you know, the best practice would be for the company to actually try to actively or proactively address the prior feedback that we provided as part of the pre-submission process as part of any subsequent uh, submission that comes into house for the agency review. Okay, great. So our next question is about the 510K de novo route. Um, if the 510K leads to a de novo um, and the 510K is rejected, meaning we've perhaps find a uh, final decision of non-substantially equivalent, and then you have to go through the de novo route, then why would you choose this route over the direct de novo route in the first place? Well, so I, I think that what we would say here is that typically when you, we've chosen to submit a 510K, it's because you're, you're not clear about whether or not you actually do have a new device. Um, so you'd be using the 510K to establish whether or not it's in fact new. And then obviously once you receive the not substantially equivalent, you, you would be, have confirmed that there isn't a device of your type in existence, so you'd be proceeding to a de novo. Um, and just to clarify, you know, I think the other thing that we want to be able to differentiate is the type of NSC that you may have received. If it's an NSC per, for performance data, you know, we're essentially stating that you're still eligible for review under the auspices of the 510K program versus where if we've given you an NSC that we sort of coin the phrase as off the chart, NSC for lack of predicate, NSC for new intended use, or NSC for different technological characteristics that raise differences uh, that impact safety and effectiveness. Okay. Our next question um, speaks to using a de novo. Um, could we use a de novo clear device, that's the term that's used in the question, as a predicate device for a 510K submission? So if there's a, a device that's already been granted marketing a, a authorization through the de novo program, it's, it's already available as a predicate device. Um, you can certainly do a 510K to establish substantial equivalence to it. So the answer is yes? Yes. Okay. Um, next question. I am not clear if some class 3 devices can be approved through the de novo process or not. So, Joni, would you like to take a step so at that So, if one? we've already classified the product through a PMA application where we have you know, approved the product, we would say that that is a class 3 product. We don't believe that utilization of 513F2, a.k.a. the de novo process, is the appropriate means to address that product. You would need to go through a reclassification process, which is covered under a different statutory provision of 513F3, uh, to actually seek reclassification of that device type. Okay. I would just add, additionally, if you have a pre-amendments device, um, then you would need to seek reclassification under Section 513E. Uh, but it still wouldn't be eligible for de novo. Right. And, and the spirit for both of this is that there is opportunities for Class 3 devices to be re-regulated to the, a more appropriate um, level of control, either Class 1 or 2 as appropriate. It's just not the de novo pathway. Correct. Correct. That's okay. covered under a different process. Okay. Um, our next question how much evidence of search for predicate is needed when submitting a de novo? And I think this speaks to um, how much effort do I need to put into um, determining that my product is indeed new, a new device. I, I, I would think a reasonable level of, of search. Um, obviously, if we're giving suggestions that we think it might be a good candidate for the de novo process, I would think a much more limited review of, of other available devices. If we're telling you it's probably a suggestion, we don't believe such a device exists. Correct. And so taking a look at our classification database that's publicly available is definitely the first source of information to tap into. Okay. Our next question is about uh, pre-submissions again. During a de novo pre-submission um, interaction, will FDA advise a sponsor whether uh, de novo is the appropriate regulatory pathway? So if the sponsors come in for a pre-sub, um, proceeding a de novo, would we, uh, um, um, during that discussion, indicate to them we don't think that de novo is appropriate? 
So I think we would provide high-level feedback, um, you know, with regard to whether or not we think it's eligible for consideration as a low to moderate risk product uh, for de novo classification. I think, uh, conversely, we would also say if the product is a high-risk product, that we would think it would be a challenge to potentially be able to establish appropriate uh, general and or special controls to ensure uh, adequate safety and effectiveness of the product. Okay. But it's, it's going to be very high level of feedback, I believe, that the divisions will be providing at that stage. I would agree with that. Okay. The next question is about the direct de novo submission process. <clears throat> if as a result of FDA's review, um, FDA determines that the device is not eligible for de novo mm -hmm. and it, it was submitted as a direct de novo, will FDA then classify the device? So no, we, good question. We, we, we wouldn't classify the device, um, although it would probably be a strong indication, at least at this time, we're not aware of general or special controls that would allow us to place it in classes one or two. Um, so we would leave it uh, under, tempor at least temporarily, under Section 513F1 in class three. So Correct. if we believe there is an existing regulation classification, we wouldn't so that's so, different. Yeah, yes. that's a different question. Right. So if we believe that there's already an existing classification regulation for the product, we would notify the company of that, okay. um, probably encourage the company to consider withdrawal. Uh, otherwise, we would end up denying the de novo. Okay. Okay, this next question is a bit specific. Um, if a predicate device is otherwise appropriate, except for the age range of the patient, population in the intent indications for use. Is the de novo pathway appropriate? So this is question speaking to a new device. It's awfully similar to another device. It normally would fall into the 510K pathway, but the trigger for bumping it out possibly might be the age range. Is that enough to land it into the de novo pathway? It's a I, I would, question. I would say that's that's a depends question. Sure. Right. Um, we, we would strongly encourage someone to submit a pre-submission if they had right. a case like that, and we could address the fact-specific questions. Correct. And I think you know another thing for the individual who actually asked that question: take a look at the general to specific intended use guidance to see whether or not any of the factors that are identified in that guidance uh, seem to raise additional concern. There are seven factors in that guidance document uh, for consideration. Okay. Um, what is the expected timeline to receive a response for a pre-submission application for a device? And is it su suggested to complete one during all parts of the investigation of the device? So for pre-submission feedback, yes. that's going to be, or it should be in accordance with our guidance document. Um, and I believe, and I'm going to probably quote the time frame wrong, but we have a 90-day review time. I think we're targeting 75 days to provide feedback uh, for just a Q-sub. Uh, if it's a submission issue, where in other words, there is a de novo that's under active review and the company is seeking clarification on a specific issue, that would be a submission issue type of pre-sub where the feedback time frame is 21 days, I believe. Okay. Um, the next question, if a direct de novo is submitted um, and FDA, so this is it's kind of a follow-up to one of the prior questions. If a direct de novo is submitted and FDA believes there is a predicate already established for that product, what action would FDA take to communicate to the sponsor and what options would the sponsor have for next steps? So I think it would go back to, mm -hmm. to kind of what Joni already indicated, that, that we'd communicate with the company and just convey that we believe there's already an appropriate classification for that type of device. Um, I think generally a company would probably withdraw at that point, but if, if they mm -hmm. didn't, then um, we deny it, and in our denial order, we indicate the, what we believe to be the appropriate classification for that type of device. Okay. The next question is about timelines. What is the typical time to, to clearance for a de novo submission? Are, and then the Part B, are there review timelines and deadlines placed on FDA associated with a de novo submission? So by statute, we, there's 120 FDA days to review a uh, de novo submission. Um, at this time, those are the only sorts of uh, uh, guidelines associated with them. 
Yeah, and I will add on because I know there is a little bit of a dichotomy between the timelines associated with OIR bringing many of their de novos to closure versus ODE bringing ours to closure. So we are certainly striving to improve our time frames associated with de novo review. Uh, we are striving to have 60-day review cycles. We're not there yet, but it is something that we are diligently working on to try to ensure that we can actually meet the 120-day FDA review time clock. I guess I, I would just clarify what I, I previously said. Mm -hmm. uh, independent of the, the statutory time frame, obviously we try to review them as quickly as we can. And, and I think many of times our review times are well below the 120-day um, statutory timeline. I have a caller. Okay. So we'll take our next question from the phones. Um, we have a call from Chris from Manassas. Chris, what is your question? Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for taking the call. My question is regarding the uh, pre-submission process you all had discussed. Um, could you provide a little information about what is typically required at this meeting or provide information on, as to how we could set up a pre-sub um, or possibly give us uh, information as to where we could find it online? So there's a guidance document uh, that I would strongly encourage you pull off of our website. Uh, and that way you will find the criteria and even some example questions that you may want to consider submitting as part of your submission. I would also suggest that you take a look at our draft de novo guidance document that's not for implementation, but it does also give you some information specifically related to pre-submissions that are related to de novos for your consideration. Chris, did that answer your question? It did. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll take another call from the email. Okay, so let's follow up with the question about that draft guidance. Um, what are the plans for the draft guidance and when will it go final? <laughs> well, I don't have a magic eight ball, um, <laughs> but uh, the comment period has officially closed for the guidance document, so we are in the process of reviewing the comments that we have received. Uh, to ensure that we are appropriately addressing those comments, and then our intent and plan will be to finalize that guidance document. Excellent. Um, the next question may be for Scott. Um, how can I get an assurance that my de novo will qualify for de novo? So I, I think if you, you have a um, product that you think might qualify, I would strongly encourage you to submit a pre-submission. Um, alternatively, if, if we've already indicated to you that we believe it might be a good candidate for the de novo process, then that'd be a strong indicator that it'd probably be worth pursuing a, a de novo. Um, although we can't make any guarantees that a, a device will be approved through the de novo process. It still depends on, on what the facts and the data say. Okay. So for this next question, um, the emailer wants to hedge their bets. So they don't know they have a de novo device. So the question is, should I submit a 510K at the same time as submitting a de novo and work through those processes at the same time? So, Joni, what's your advice? No, is okay. the short answer <laughs> to that. Uh, you know, we don't want to have parallel review submissions going on at the same time. About the only exception to the rule that we make for that is for a pre-sub with another submission that's under active review. And then that would fall under, you know, like a, a submission issue Q-sub, where the submission may be on hold and the sponsor seeking additional clarification. Okay. Okay, for this next question, um, it's a pretty long one. Can we do the de novo request directly now, or must we file a 5 k first? Um, the presentation talked about the two pathways that are available. Um, and in particular, uh, there's reference to the 2014 draft guidance, which talks about direct de novo. So I guess the mm -hmm. question is, is the direct de novo um, process available now? Mm -hmm. It is, and many people are already taking advantage of it. Uh, so if you have looked at the criteria for de novo and you believe your device is eligible, um, aside from making sure, I would recommend a pre-submission before you do a, a de novo submission. Um, I, I think it's perfectly available and people are already using it. Yeah, and just to add on, one of the rate limiting factors oftentimes from going forward in an efficient and effective manner is the lack of data. So, I mean, I think that's one take home message that I hope our uh, listeners today would appreciate is that, you know, we really do need to have the data to ensure that there's a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness and to ensure that the special controls that we are establishing can appropriately mitigate the risks to health. Excellent. Our next question is about statistics. 
Um, could you provide a rough statistic of how many de novo applications we receive annually? Um, and do we see more 510Ks leading to de novos or direct de novo submissions? So maybe start with... Well, so I would, I would actually re refer the caller to the report that is put out for Madufa 3 uh, because there is some publicly available information with regard to the number of de novo submissions that we have uh, that are under active review and have been submitted. So that would be the, the place where you're going to get the most up-to-date information. I believe in fiscal year 14, it's either 41 or 42 de novos that we have received, which is certainly an uptick mm -hmm. from what we have seen in the years past. So if you look at our trends from prior to 2012, our numbers are higher mm -hmm. than what they were in the past. And are you in the Part B of this was, are we seeing um, an increase in direct de novos? versus 510Ks that then lead to de novos? So, uh, speaking anecdotally, I, I would definitely say since Fidesia, probably like a few months out from Fidesia, I would say definitely the, the majority have been going toward direct de novos. But we still get the, the cases where it wasn't necessarily clear to the company and or they, they thought they were going to fit under the 510K pathway and ended up not being a good fit, but they still came in through the de novo pathway. Okay, great. All right, so for our next question, um, I'd like to track down a particular de novo decision that was made by FDA. What's, um, what's your advice on the best way for someone to do this? So there's, there's two good websites for doing that. There's the de novo transparency website that CRH has, and that lists all of our de novos, I believe, since 2008. Um, and there's also the uh, product classification database. You can go in there, and they'll pull up the de novos that way, too. So whichever you feel more comfortable with. Right, and so they do contain different information. The uh, classification database is going to give you more real-time data with regard to submissions and uh, decisions that we have made in a more timely manner. The transparency web page includes a little bit more detailed information because it includes that transparency summary. And there is a lag uh, in time sometimes from getting that information posted. I think they both have the uh, decision summaries and uh, order letters. Um, they populate both locations at the same okay. time, I believe, uh, but I could, I could be mistaken. Okay, our next question. I received an NSC for my device. Can I try to change my intended use so I can and revisit the 510K process, or must I go to the de novo pathway? I'm sorry, could you restate that question? Sure. <laughs> so um, an applicant has um, submitted a 510K, and they received... Um, an NSC, and I'll, let's infer here it's based on a new intended use. Right. Okay. Um, they want to know, can I change my intended use and submit a new 510K, or must I go to the um, go through the de novo pathway at this point? So I would think the answer would be that you, you definitely could, if you could find a type of intended use um, that has been classified, you could pursue a 510K via that pathway. Um, but again, it's dependent on whether or not you can find a, a device with that intended use that, that you found. Um, to serve as a predicate. Correct, and I think it also depends just to modify your intended use if that's not really the purpose or the principle of operation of your product is not necessarily appropriate. So I think it depends is a safe answer. So for this next question, I think Jenny talked about it, um, but maybe I'll give you a chance to even add a little bit more. Um, the de novo process was not in place when my medical device was considered a new device, and as a result it was classified into class three. So what are my options to reclassify the device into class two? So we did talk about, both Scott and I talked about this earlier, um, you know, essentially if the product uh, has already been approved through the PMA process, um, you know, you could submit a reclassification petition and request that uh, we consider a, a, a lower class of regulation for the product. Um, Scott, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. No, I mean, I think that's, that's right. Uh, if, if, if you're getting into the nuances, if you have a pre-amendments device, right. the way to do it would be 513E. If you have a post-amendments device that was classified in a class three right. uh, because of a, a PMA approval, then you would need to uh, do section 513F3. Right. Excellent. Our next emailed question, um, 510Ks have a format guidance that helps us, uh, helps us assemble the 510K submission. Is there something similar for de novos? And if not, are there any plans to, to develop a similar guidance for a de novo submission? 
So if you, if you look at the, uh, the draft de novo guidance, it, obviously we're already looking at actually putting out something like that in the draft de novo guidance mm -hmm. itself. Um, when finalized, that would be our suggestion about the type of content that we believe would be appropriate in a de novo. Right, attachment to. Okay. Next question. So de novos tend to be for lower risk, low to moderate risk devices. This question simply asks, are implants eligible for de novos? So the answer is yes, they are, if you can make the argument that your product is a moderate risk product where uh, special controls can be established to ensure a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness. Um, we actually have granted marketing authorization from uh, some moderate risk implants um, more recently, uh, which I know is a shift perhaps from where we were previously uh, with regard to the de novo process. Okay. The next can, I, can I just add a little yes. bit tag on to that? Sure. Too? I think the other thing that, you know, uh, if the product fits the statutory definition of a class three product and it's life supporting, life sustaining, I think, you know, those are things that we also want to consider as to whether or not de novo is the appropriate pathway for the product. Thank you, Jenny, for adding that in additional Sorry. info. All right, and our next question, um, are there any helpful hints or suggestions for the types of devices? that would likely fall into the de novo category. So maybe we'll start with um, types of devices for ODE. So types of devices, you know, it's, it's really going to depend. Um, you know, I would suggest that you look at similar types of technology that we may have already classified into a class two bucket, if you want to call it as such, mm -hmm. uh, because that way we are sort of establishing that we think that it's appropriate for the product arena to be regulated through a class two um, risk profile. Uh, I can't really give you specifics because it's really going to depend on the data that the company has provided, also whether or not the risks can be appropriately mitigated through appropriate special controls. I think the other thing that we uh, are also trying not to blur um, is with regard to what should fit into a class two bucket versus what's appropriate for a class three uh, product. Uh, and so there are some additional protection measures and uh, means of getting additional information provided through a PMA application. So if it's critical that we get annual reports or it's critical that we have site changes or 30-day notices provided to uh, the agency or a manufacturing review is a critical element. You know, those are things that we would consider uh, as well as whether or not it fits the statutory criteria of a class three uh, product to make a determination as to whether a class two would be appropriate or class three. Thank you, Joni. We actually have time for just one more question, and if we have a quick one, it would be nice. So I'd like to um, have maybe Scott follow up on that with respect to in vitro diagnostics. Are there patterns or, um, again, um, the question asked about the types of devices that would lend themselves to a de novo, so uh, maybe for IVDs. I think our, our situation would be very similar to, to Joni, um, although I think we have probably much fewer class three type devices. I, I think it's usually worth a pre-submission discussion with us and again it'll depend really on what the science says and what your data says and what sorts of special controls you believe you can come up with that would allow us to mitigate the risks. Okay, so I think Scott gets the last word. Okay, <laughs> thank, thank you, Scott you guys. And thank you panelists. Uh, that's all the time we have so um, if you have further questions please send them to DICE at hhs.gov and if we didn't take the questions that you've already submitted please send your questions to that email address. The slides for today's program will be available on CDRH Learn by Friday, this Friday, and the video segments will be available in about two weeks. Thank you all for your participation and for your thoughtful questions. This concludes this portion of our CDRH Industry Basics Workshop. We'll now take an hour-long lunch break and we'll begin our next presentation on Corrective and Preventive Actions, or CAPA, at 2 o'clock. Also, please provide your feedback by completing the survey which is provided on our website at www.fda.gov backslash CDRH webinar. See you in just a little while.
Hello, my name is Joe Tartle, and I am the Post Market and Consumer Branch Chief in the Division of Industry and Consumer Education. The topic of corrective and preventive action is an important one. It is a gauge to the health of your quality system. Everyone knows that problems such as nonconformities can and do occur. The big questions, are you able to identify them, and what do you do about them? I worked in industry for close to 15 years establishing quality systems, including developing effective corrective and preventive action systems. Since 2006, I have worked at FDA. During that time, I have worked with both the Office of Regulatory Affairs and the Office of Compliance on educational outreach and understand the agency's expectations for quality. We all share the same common goal to ensure safe and effective medical devices are on the market, and corrective and preventive action ensures that big or reoccurring problems are either resolved or do not occur in the first place. So by the end, I want you to walk away with these learning objectives and understand these concepts. Know the purpose of corrective and preventive action, have the ability to distinguish between each of the defined terms, understand the requirements in 21 CFR 820, the quality system regulation, identify various types of data and tools that can be used to meet those regulatory requirements, recognize examples and best practices, and of course, be aware of compliance concerns. The purpose of corrective and preventive action, again, is to aid in adequately assessing the effectiveness of your overall quality system. This is one of the reasons why it's reviewed during all FDA routine inspections, both level one baseline and level two abbreviated inspections. This is per the compliance program guide. So the purpose is to collect and analyze information to identify actual and potential product and quality problems. It's an overarching system. It collects and receives information throughout other parts of the quality system and has many sources. And its fingers are almost everywhere throughout your quality system. Another purpose is to investigate product and quality problems and take appropriate and effective actions. Okay, so the aspect is that once you know and have identified something is wrong, to do something about it. And it requires addressing those causes that you take action against. Also, the purpose is to verify or validate the effectiveness of those corrective or preventive actions taken. Ensure that you've taken the right actions and that you can confirm that those are the right actions. Another purpose is to communicate corrective and preventive inform action information to the appropriate people, that those information is shared with those responsible. And also, to provide that information for management for a review, because remember, quality systems is a top-down approach, and executive management needs to understand when issues are occurring. And last, to document those activities so that they are available for review at other times. Next, we're going to talk about definitions. We're going to talk about the definitions of correction, corrective action, and preventive action. These terms are not defined in 21 CFR 820. However, they are defined per ISO 9001, and specifically, the preamble discusses its harmonization and intent of the terminology to ISO 9001-1994. These definitions are taken from the ISO 2005 vocabulary and also are used in the Global Harmonization Task Force Guidance Corrective and Preventive Action. So a correction is an action to eliminate a detected nonconformity. And a detected nonconformity is, means the non-fulfillment of a specified requirement. A correction can be made in conjunction with a corrective action. A correction can be, for example, rework or regrade. So for example, if in my slide I have a misspelled word and I go into the slide and just change that single misspelled word, that is a correction. Whereas a corrective action is to eliminate the cause of that nonconformity or other undesirable situation. There can be more than one cause for the nonconformity, and a corrective action is taken to prevent reoccurrence of that nonconformity. And there is a difference between the corrective, correction and corrective action. For example, the misspelled word. If I go into the slide and change that one misspelled word, that is a correction. However, if I determine that I need to figure out what the cause of that misspelled word is, either that I'm not reviewing the slides or that there's difficult words in it. I may go back and try to determine why those misspelled words have made it into my slides. I may do something like add spell check to part of my presentation development process and that would be considered a corrective action. Now preventive action is an action to eliminate the cause of the potential nonconformity or other undesirable situation. 
there can be, again, more than one cause for a potential nonconformity. And a preventive action is taken to prevent the occurrence in the first place. So using my example of the misspelled word in my slide again, if it happens before the nonconformance occur, so the potential problem does not become an actual problem, then that is a preventive action. So for example, if I know that another group is doing presentations and I've seen that misspelled words has caused problems with their audience, I can go back and institute using spell check prior to me ever putting a presentation slide deck together and that could be considered a preventive action. So the difference between a correction, I'm eliminating the actual nonconformity itself, a corrective action, I'm eliminating the cause of the nonconformity, or a preventive action where I'm el eliminating the cause of a potential nonconformity. The nonconformity has not occurred in the first place. So with that, we move on to the regulatory requirements. These are what you're required to do. And it is one of the next learning objectives that we put forward in the beginning of our presentation. So establish and maintain procedures for implementing corrective and preventive action. And by establish, we mean define, document, and implement. Do it. So depending on the type of device that you manufacture, the risk of that device, the complexity of both the device and the manufacturing process, and the complexity of your organization will help you define and develop how you're going to establish your corrective and preventive action procedures. And of course, you're going to follow sections A1 through A7 per 21 CFR 820.100A. The preamble speaks about procedures. The procedures for impl implementing corrective and preventive action must provide for control and action to be taken on devices distributed and those not yet distributed that are suspected of having potential nonconformities. So note that this is broader than just the requirements in complaint handling 820.198 and non-conforming product, A20.90. The preamble is telling you this. It's telling you that CAPA is going, your CAPA procedures are going to have a very broad scope and go throughout your quality system. And it tells you that you're going to address not just immediate problems, but even across product families or possibly other product lines. Where to start? Planning is always a good place to start, and this is an example of a quality plan. And these particular plans are taken from the Global Harmonization Task Force Guidance for Corrective and Preventive Action 2010, which can now be accessed at the International Medical Device Regulator Forum's website. So the first part of this is establishing data sources and criteria. You want to understand what it is that you need to measure and when, and what the threshold is for entering into corrective and preventive actions. Not everything that you do, not every nonconformity, is going to go into corrective action and preventive action system. Next, you're going to have to measure and analyze those different data sources. So you need to define how and what way you're going to do this. Quantitative when possible, and if qualitative, you want to minimize all subjectivity. And these should link to other information that you've already gathered. So this is where other systems feed into your corrective action and preventive action system. Such um, measurement and analysis tools should actually be developed around things that you've already been working during the product development as part of your design controls. Things like risk analysis and essential outputs are things that feed into those measuring and analysis data source that have already been identified. Next, improvement plans. How are you going to use this information now that you have this great data that you've been gathering around and when you've met that threshold as to something that needs to be entered into corrective action and preventive action. So you want to have some sort of feedback into how you're going to utilize that information. And of course, last, input to management. You need to be able to look at who it is that this needs to be provided to and again, when. So you're going to have establishing data sources as the first part of that plan. And per 21, CFR 820.100A1, you're required to analyze data sources, ones that identify both product and quality issues. And these can come from both internal sources as well as external sources. And here are some examples of that internal source data. You have process control data, such as statistical process control monitoring that has been developed during process validation. 
This can feed into as one of those data sources that can be a trigger for corrective action and preventive action. Test and inspection data. Are you meeting your predetermined criteria? Device history records, which can be trended over time to see how things have been working with regards to those criteria that you set. Internal audits, the next two bullet points, non-conforming material reports and rework scrap yield data relate back to the efficiency of your operations. So if I'm a manufacturer, I want to look at this material because are these things that I've predicted or are these things that are now new and I'm having greater yields of scrap or I'm having more non-conforming material reports which end up being issues with regards to your manufacturing process and your product as a whole. And of course, training records. Not only are these employees trained, but is the training itself effective? So these are examples of internal data sources that can feed into corrective and preventive action. Next are some external data sources that can feed into the system. Supplier controls. You know, as they relate to purchasing 21 CFR 820.50, Sometimes different vendors or suppliers will be given vendor corrective action reports or supplier corrective action reports in order to ensure that reoccurring problems are either stopped or if it's a, a big issue that the problem is taken care of at the supplier source. As the manufacturer, you have the final responsibility over top of your suppliers. And of course, your customers are going to be a great source of data. And that could be from customer feedback or complaints themselves. And those complaints, as per 820.198, could trigger and feed into a kappa. Servicing and repairs is another source. And servicing repairs, some may be known service, which is fine, but if you're running into unexpected or other type of maintenance issues that weren't um, identified during design or identified at other places, it may feed back into your corrective and preventive action system. And of course, adverse event reporting. Both your own adverse event reporting as well as um, things that are identified as research during looking at FDA's MAUD database or even similar devices from competitors with regards to the MAUD database. These are things that could be an example of ones that have not had an actual problem with your product but could be a potential one that becomes a preventive action. And while the preventive actions may be ones that are difficult to identify, they also have the biggest impact because you're able to make that change before they become an actual product problem. So even similar de devices from competitors with regards to MAUD, as well as looking at um, recall databases can be utilized as an external data source for your own corrective and preventive action system. So once you have this data that's being fed in, you now have to do some sort of data analysis of this material. So you have to analyze these processes, work operations, concessions, quality and audit reports, quality records, service records, complaints, return product, and other identified sources to determine what is going on with them. Again, the requirement is to identify and analyze data sources available to you. And this is broad and encompassing, and you have to determine the priority and how. So a couple ways to do this are, one, using some different approaches to looking at both non-statistical and statistical techniques for doing data analysis. The first is to use a risk-based approach to rank the areas. ISO 14971 is the standard for risk management. And while it's not a requirement, it is a consensus standard that FDA recommends you utilize for doing this risk-based approach. And this way you can select items with major impact and look at them from either both product-related or process-related standpoints. And of course, you want to process these items from high to low impact, eventually assuring that all areas are being addressed. One of the good reasons to do this is that everyone understands that people are limited by their resources. So how do you go to the biggest and find out the biggest issues first and then work your way back to those lower issues while addressing all of them? And using a risk-based approach is one of the ways to do that. Another way to do this data analysis is to use statistical methodology. And per 21 CFR 820-100, you want to use appropriate statistical methodology shall be employed when necessary to de detect reoccurring quality problems. Now, from an FDA standpoint, 
you need to be able to explain the use of these statistical methodologies and how they fit into with setting up your thresholds and your criteria for entering into corrective and preventive actions. So you should be able to explain why this methodology was used and how it is linked back into the criteria that you have set. So next, after you set those different analysis, you have to determine cause. So the regulation is telling you that you have to investigate to determine the cause of the nonconformance relating to both product, processes, and the quality system. Now from this standpoint, what I'll tell you in my own experience is you need to be objective here. Do not jump to conclusions, drill down, try to get to the root cause. So we talked about training as an internal source. One of the things that I have seen identified when I was doing auditing was if I could see training being used over and over and over again as a corrective action, I would then question how much of an investigation was done to determine the cause. Because if I'm seeing the same corrective action over and over again, but that's not um, changing the actual problem from going away, I then have to make the leap to question the training program as a whole. And that's where you want to step back and be able to investigate to determine the cause and try to get to the root cause. Because that's where you want to make your corrective action occur. And the preamble talks about investigations. And again, it talks about that the requirement in the section is broader than the requirements for complaints. Because it requires that non-conforming product discovered before or after distribution be investigated to degree significant to that risk. And again, this goes back to us talking about risk being used as one of those analysis tools. So the preamble on investigation tells you to use risk to look at both product that's been discovered before its release and after its release. So it's broader than both 820.198 complaints and broader than 820.90 non-conforming product. And it continues on that the requirement is also a section that applies to process and quality system nonconformities as well. So if during process validation you had determined as part of that process that in the molding process there was a known rate of a normal 5% rejection rate and that rate now increases to 10%, you should do an investigation to try to determine why this change occurred. So you want to link and look at, okay, we've already been able to establish the process parameter being at 5%. We now see 10%. Something has changed in our process. This is something that should likely be fed into having an investigation done and likely have a corrective and preventive action open for it to do that investigation because something has changed from that initial process validation. So, now that you've done that, you have to identify the corrective and preventive action that you want to take. So the regulation tells you to identify the actions needed to correct and prevent the reoccurrence of that nonconforming product or other quality problem. So going back to that example of the 5 to 10 percent defect, you now have identified it. You now need to get to an investigation to determine what the cause of it is and now look at what action needs to be taken. So what are you going to do? And again, risk plays a big part to this. So what type of action can be taken? You can either take no further action. You can either make a correction, one and done. You can do a corrective action, which stops it from reoccurring. Or if you have identified that the actual problem hasn't occurred, but there's a potential that it could occur, you can do a preventive action to stop it from occurring in the first place. So these are your possibilities. And again, not everything goes into the corrective and preventive action system. So you have to make a determination from the information that you've seen as to what's going to be fed into corrective and preventive action. So what does the preamble say with regards to risk and what you need to do? So the degree of corrective and preventive action taken should be to eliminate or minimize actual or potential nonconformities must be appropriate to the magnitude of that problem. So not all problems are going to be the same. It's going to link back into the risk of those issues. The higher the risk, the greater action you're going to need to take. And these could range from having a full device design change to just making a change on a documentation to look for some better clarification on 
what that process entails and the training for doing that particular process. This will all depend on risk. Then once you've determined what it is that you're going to do, what corrective action is going to be taken, you need to verify or validate the corrective and preventive action to ensure that it is going to be effective and it does not adversely affect the finished device. So with that, we'll go back to our example with spell check. So if I make a corrective action that I'm going to use spell check and I later find out that it's changing words within my presentation, I need now to go back to see whether or not that spell check is causing other issues with regards to the presentation and the words being changed. So I need to make sure not just that it's effective, but it does not adversely affect other aspects, that it doesn't adversely affect the other aspects of that finished device. So you need to go back and verify when you can and validate if you can't verify that the action is going to be effective and again, that it does not adversely affect the finished device. So the preamble talks about verification and validation. FDA has revised Section 820.1084 to reflect that preventive as well as corrective action must be verified or validated. One of the things that was brought up during the preamble discussion was, well, why do we have to go back and verify or validate preventive action? Well, the same question with regards that I just asked with regards to my spell check example is if I see that someone else is using spell check or someone else is having spelling issues and I make that change that I'm going to use spell check, it could have an adverse impact on my final product. So I need to go back and ensure that it does not have that impact on my final product. And that's why preventive action as well as corrective action has to be verified or validated. And then, of course, you have to implement that corrective and preventive action. And you have to implement and record changes in methods and procedures needed to correct and prevent those identified quality problems. So this is where I've seen it, not just with regards to our industry and medical devices, but in several industries with different products where they do all the investigation, they do all the work to even identify what the corrective or preventive action should be, and then they don't do the implementation. And this is something where if you watch general news every month or so, you'll hear about different examples that have occurred where companies knew about an issue, they've investigated the issue, they even identified that corrective and preventive action, but they failed to implement it. And that has a huge impact both on the trust that you have with us as a regulatory agency, but also the trust that your customers have with you. So I would say if you find out that something's been put through your system, you have to implement it. You have to do something about it. And of course, once you've implemented it and you've done it, you now need to communicate this information. So you need to give this information to those directly responsible for assuring the quality of such product or the prevention of such problems. So if I'm a person and I'm working on that particular product area, I need to be in the know that this particular corrective action or preventive action has been put into place. And of course, I also need to submit that relevant information up to management for management review. So management, they have to be aware of what is going on. They have to be aware that these problems are occurring and what you're doing about them. And the preamble talks about CAPA activities with regards to management review. And what it says is that only certain information needs to be directed to management, that they don't need to hear every specific detail, but they do need to hear everything that's relevant with regards to what's going on. FDA emphasizes it's always management's responsibility to ensure that all nonconformity issues are handled appropriately. Whether they're handled through correction, corrective action, or preventive action, it all goes back to management responsibility. So you don't need to explain every detail, but you do need to make sure that information is provided to them. And you can provide it at a higher level, but make sure that they have enough information that they understand what those issues are. Value their time. Their time is important. So during these management review meetings, make sure that you put that information in a particular way that they can be able to understand and be able to see. Last, you're going to have to document all those corrective action and preventive action activities. 
You're going to have to document those that are required underneath the section 820.100B, which tells you to document everything under 820.100A, A1 through 7. Because from a general standpoint, if it, didn't, if it wasn't documented, it didn't occur. So you want to make sure that you document everything that now has occurred through that corrective and preventive action system, including the procedures in order to implement this process and to do it as well as all the actual work that comes from the different things that have been identified through your different internal and external sources that have been investigated, that have been determined to be analyzed to see root cause, and the implementation of that actual particular action that's taken. And then even the documentation all the way up through who was told about it, as well as its review by management. So, the preamble also talks about corrective and preventive actions with regards to internal audits and management reviews. So as a general policy, the Office of Regulatory Affairs during inspections does not look at the actual findings of internal audits. They'll look at your procedures for internal audits, your schedules, but they won't look at the actual findings. Same thing with management review. They will not look at the actual management review meeting minutes, but they will look at your procedures for doing management review, as well as an agenda or possibly those that signed in to be part of that meeting. But they won't look at the meeting minutes themselves. This is true in all cases except for corrective action and preventive action. So for these, these are things that FDA has said in the preamble that they have authority to review the records as they relate to this particular system. And they can do so because it's an obligation with regards to protecting the public health. And this is one of those things where manufacturers do not want to try to restrict this information by hiding issues in internal audits or management reviews. With regards to corrective action and preventive action, you want to be able to show what you're doing about issues that you have self-identified and how you're planning or have planned to implement corrective actions or preventive actions to make those changes. So I argue that during an FDA inspection, manufacturers should consider that these corrective actions and preventive action documentation, even as they are part of your internal audits or as part of your man management reviews, are a way to demonstrate to FDA that your quality system is effective it enables you as a manufacturer to self-identify the problems and implement effective ways to stop them from reoccurring or not occurring in the first place. It shows you that you are in control of your own system and shows FDA that you're in control of your own system and can adapt and handle problems and nonconformances, both quality process nonconformities as well as product nonconformities. There are guidance documents available. The first is the Quality Management System Medical Device Guidance from Global Harmonization Task Force, Guidance on Corrective Action and Preventive Action as it relates to quality management system processes. This guidance gives great detail in ways to meet the regulatory requirements of corrective action and preventive actions. So I would recommend that you spend some time Looking up this source material, it's underneath of now the International Medical Device Regulator Forum's webpage in archive section for Global Harmonization Task Force. It spells out different aspects that you can use to help build your corrective action and preventive action system for your quality system. Spend some time, review it, take the ideas that work for your device and your system, and utilize what you think will work well. Another guidance which is written specifically for doing quality audits is the Nonconforming Grading System for Regulatory Purpose and Information Exchange, also done by the Global Harmonization Task Force. It too is on the International Medical Device Regulators Forum website. This one is written though specifically for auditing. However, there is some good ideas in it with regards to grading and using risk to set up grading systems for nonconformities, both nonconformity product as well as nonconformity processes and systems. So this is another quality management system guidance that's available that you can draw and get some ideas from. So I would spend some time 
looking through both of these documents. And of course, FDA has its own educational tools that we provide to industry, such as CDRH Learn, which is a multimedia educational tool which uses video modules and recordings with PowerPoint presentations to provide information, Device Advice, which is a comprehensive text-based educational tool, and of course, the last, my own division, the Division of Industry and Consumer Education, who's available to answer questions by email and by phone on medical devices. Thank you for your attention today. Thank you for viewing the CAPA presentation. I hope you found it informative. I'm Heather Howe, Deputy Director of CDRH's Office of Communication and Education. And this is Elias Malice, Director of our Division of Industry and Consumer Education. We're joined now by your presenter, Mr. Joe Tartle. Thank you, Joe. Also joining us to help respond to your questions are Tanya Wilbon, Quality Systems Specialist in CDRH's Office of In Vitro Diagnostics and Radiological Health, and Eric Horowitz, Quality Systems Working Group Lead from CDRH's Office of Compliance. Please remember, you can submit questions by clicking the Ask a Question icon, which appears at the top of your screen. You can also call the phone number you see on the screen now to ask your question live. While we're waiting for your calls, we'll get started with some email questions you've already submitted. The first question is a short one. Does a preventative action have to follow a corrective action? So let's start with Tanya. Sure. And the answer to that is actually no. Um, preventive action and corrective action are actually two separate actions. Mainly a corrective action is conducted in order to eliminate the recurrence of um, a nonconformity or another quality issue. Whereas a preventive action is performed and implemented in order to ensure that a nonconformance does not occur. So they're actually two separate actions. Okay, great. So let's um, get to our next question. Um, what is the timeline for closing the CAPA per common industry practice? So maybe, Eric, uh, you can field this one. Sure. There's no specific requirement that a, a given timeline has to be used uh, while, um, while closing a CAPA. Um, what you really should be doing is looking at the corrective action that you need to take, identifying milestones so that you can reach where you need to be, um, and understand the fact that the expectation is that the CAPA will be done in enough time so that you, the CAPA is actually meaningful and you're able to prevent additional problems from occurring. Um, but there is no specific timeline that you should be following. It really should be commensurate with the activity that's going on. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so for our next question, since the FDA can review CAPAs but, but does not review internal audit reports, if an internal audit triggers a CAPA, can the FDA then review that specific CAPA? So maybe Tanya? Yes, certainly. Um, definitely the agency does have the authority to review that information contained in that CAPA that actually perhaps was open um, due to the information obtained during the internal audit report. So, yes, most certainly. Okay. And mm -hmm. there was a follow-up to that uh, question. So if yes, can the internal audit procedure be written to handle this, the audit finding as a audit correction? That contains all of the basic components of a CAPA, but is an audit document to restrict FDA's access to it? <laughs> Actually, no, you cannot, you, you do not want to engage in writing your internal audit procedures that perhaps include that CAPA information because we will um, have access to that information. So you may want to remove that and separate those, those processes out so that we can have access to that if you, you know, don't want us to look at your internal audit information. Okay. And to be clear, uh, it's an expectation that internal audits will be an input into your CAPA system. So if we look at your CAPA system and we see that internal audits aren't an input into that system, then it may be identified as, as something that throws up a few red flags that really something needs to be addressed there because you're not really utilizing your CAPA system the way that you should be. 
Excellent. Okay. Let's get that, um, to our next email question. How should the threshold for taking action be determined? Um, sure, I can take that one. Uh, there is no set way of determining the threshold for when an action should be taken. The, an action should be taken uh, in instances where it's warranted. And the way that you make that determination of whether it's warranted is through multiple sources, whether it be through, um, through a complaint, through a series of complaints, from a non-conforming product, from uh, certain instances of data you've collected from your manufacturing processes that you identify that a non-conforming product could be coming. Um, there are several different factors that all come into CAPA, which is why we always talk about there being multiple sources of CAPA. And that isn't to say that those sources should be viewed individually and you should have one threshold limit for each source. Those sources should be taken together to understand the situation. Correct. And if I can add a little bit to that, you're not starting in the dark here. Some of this information you're developing from your design controls as your essential design outputs as well as from your risk management. And what I've seen that's really effective is you may be making assumptions in that initial design and those initial risk management. And as you gather more data, then you should go back and circle around to see if the thresholds that you're setting, if the source points that you're collecting yes. from are the proper ones. Okay. That makes sense. And then just to, to add to that, one of your main thresholds, if you would like to define such, um, would be to make sure you are in conformance. That's either in conformance with the regulatory requirements, mm -hmm. in conformance with your own requirements, um, in conformance with your specifications for your particular product or processes. Excellent. And, Thank you. And one more point. Uh, it's very important that when thinking about those thresholds, you are tying in your risk management system and you're identifying those thresholds based on the risk that the situation poses. Thank you. So our next question, um, are there guidance documents on using the risk-based approach for initiating cap, um, CAs or PAs? Um, actually, there are one guidance document that actually comes to mind, actually it's a standard, that's the ISO um, 14971 standard um, that the agency has actually recognized. So that's, that document is available. There's also a Global Harmonization Task Force document that's available on um, corrective and preventive actions that um, is too helpful with regards to implementing risk management information and activities. And in addition to that, there is also a GHTF guidance on risk management, uh, which also speaks to how to implement risk management and does have some tie-ins to CAPA in that regard. Excellent. And there is a follow-up question regarding the um, GHTF CAPA guidance, and it's this. The GHTF CAPA guidance document emphasizes that a preventive action is not required for every corrective action. So there's multiple parts, but I'll read the first part of this. Please confirm whether or not FDA intends to enforce uh, 21 CFR 820.100. The question is whether or not we intend to enforce. And enforce. So if, if I understand the question right there, what it's saying is in the GHDF guidance, it says that a preventive action doesn't oh. always have to follow a corrective action. Yeah. I believe Tanya yes. answered that question yes. first. Mm -hmm. And yes, um, FDA does enforce 820.100, and there's nothing outside of the GHTF guidance. It's generally a misinterpretation that a preventive action has to follow a corrective action. Okay, let's, let's take a question from the phone. We have a question from Val in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Val, uh, what is your question? My question was basically the same as the one just before that you do not have to do a preventive action for every corrective action? Correct. Correct. Yes. And that's what the beginning, the introduction of the GHDF guidance explains that. And Thank that, you. And that isn't to say that you can't take a preventive action when you've taken a corrective action. You, you certainly can evaluate your quality system and identify other areas that that you haven't seen nonconformances in in response to a nonconformance in a different area 
and come to a preventive action to take, uh, but it's not a requirement. Correct, because remember the definitions of correction, corrective action, which is a nonconformity has already occurred, and preventive action, which the nonconformity has not yet occurred. It's a potential. Thank you, Val. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Let's take another question from the email. Excellent. We have quite a few. <laughs> Um, does the FDA believe there are technical challenges the developers must address and overcome related to design, testing, material analysis, manufacturing methods, etc., to resolve CAPAs? Or is this viewed more as a compliance and documentation activity? No, definitely the latter is the expectation of the agency. You definitely have to look at design controls um, that should have perhaps been addressed that now is leading to these nonconformities that you would want to address. That also may include looking at manufacturing materials, other production processes that um, perhaps led to this nonconformance occurring. So it is far greater than just documenting. Okay. And the, uh, there's, a, there's a couple more follow-up uh, to this question. So what is um, the FDA's intent with issuing a CAPA? Well, the agency does not issue the CAPAs. The firm, the manufacturer themselves are the ones that actually um, in initiate or open CAPAs in order to address um, the particular nonconformities that they have identified. And of course, keep in mind the main purpose of that is for you to be able to identify those nonconformities and then uh, uh, um, implement actions that will ensure that those nonconformities do not recur and that similar quality um, issues do not also occur as well. And you want to do that as ex expeditiously as possible to protect the public safety. And uh, <coughs> to expound on that a little bit, uh, it's important to again emphasize that difference between correction and corrective action uh, because the main purpose of corrective actions is to take a situation and really look at your quality system and identify the places where changes should occur in order to prevent the, the problem that has occurred from happening in the future, um, as opposed to a correction where you're just fixing the problem in front of you. So thank you for that, Eric. And the last part of this, this um, three-part question. So what do you hope the company will achieve with successful completion of the CAPA? So maybe it's um, So in successfully completing a CAPA, what the real expectation is, is that meaningful action has been taken after you've investigated what the underlying causes and I want to stress that it's causes. There may be multiple causes to a given situation. Um, have been identified and that those meaningful actions have been taken in order to prevent uh, nonconformances, prevent, uh, prevent nonconforming practices uh, as well as nonconforming products. Um, uh, and that you have looked at those actions that you were going to take, have taken, and that you have verified or validated that they are effective and they don't adversely affect the finished product. Um, and that last one is very important because it's, it's very important for you not only to be identifying actions to take and just taking them, you really need to ensure that the action that you took really had the effect that you wanted it to. Let's, take a, let's take a question from the phone. Uh, we have a caller from Canada. Uh, Gabriella, what is your question? Hello. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to ask this question. Um, I would have a question regarding um, the FDA's expectation would, um, in a case that is pretty difficult. Um, the scenario is this. A manufacturer is facing recurrent device failure. Uh, the investigation reveals that the cause is, uh, the, is the design, but in reality the, the root cause of the problem uh, is attributed to um, insufficient um, knowledge, insufficient science at this point, and the manufacturer has to live with the problem. Um, 
So the problem will continue to occur and the manufacturer will implement some measures. Now the question is what would be the FDA's expectation with regard to this situation? All right, so um, here the agency, as we um, indicated previously, is that the expectation is, number one, that you um, try to focus and identify the cause, uh, if there's only one, a root cause, which we try to shy away from using that term. Um, so if you're able to um, adequately and appropriately identify the causes of that nonconformance, and then um, at that time, identify what actions, corrective actions as well as corrections to eliminate the immediate nonconformity, but if you're able to adequately identify the actions, that again will ensure that that nonconformity does not reoccur or any other similar quality issues do not reoccur, i.e. if you've identified that perhaps training and lack of knowledge um, is, is <coughs> identified as the cause, that's one of the reasons why that first portion of, of one of your actions for implementing a CAPA is to analyze those quality data sources. Your internal training, information from training, um, would perhaps feed into that particular nonconformance since you identified that perhaps knowledge base or experience may have been the cause to that. So you want to look at that information and determine whether or not the, the person performing those activities uh, leading to that nonconformity were actually appropriately trained and then decide what would be um, appropriate in order to ensure that that person does not um, contribute to that nonconformance occurring again or contribute to any other additional quality issues. Thank you, Tanya. Gabriella, does that answer your question? Um, yes, somehow. Probably I didn't present the scenario uh, very well. I was thinking actually as those situations when you know that the the problem would recur because the industry doesn't have the knowledge to solve the problem. Um, I was thinking, for instance, that infusion pumps and other groups of products that uh, we know that they cause uh, numerous recalls and other other uh, types of problems. And so that, can I? Oh. <laughs> and the, the question I would go back is: Is it a problem that meets the threshold of going into corrective or preventive action, which could be a change in your design? So, if you're doing something that requires a design change because you either have a high risk or reoccurring nonconformity, then that's something that you would try to address through your design. Now, the question goes back to that the technology doesn't exist with regards to that design aspect, you have to look back and see with regards to the benefit risk of that particular device and that design, what you need to do and whether or not that product should be on the market or shouldn't be on the market. But that would be up to all the information and data you're gathering. But I would go back and, and do that hard risk analysis and, and look at that from a risk standpoint. And if I could add to that, um, the the expectation is that uh, your company is responsible for ensuring that your products are safe and effective. Um, if you identify some way in which your products are not safe and effective, um, then it comes down to risk management um, and identifying whether you really have a product that is safe and effective. And if you, there is not a technological uh, or any sort of scientific way that you can bring your product to that place where it is safe and effective, then you do have to question, is this a product that we should have on the market? And also, I, I wanted to add, too, remember, you can utilize those um, additional external data sources for you to gain additional technological experience and knowledge, perhaps your competitors, information from competitors, as well as information um, obtained from complaints from those individuals that are actually using your products. And that will, again, provide you some additional, you know, understanding uh, of your of your particular device that you did not initially have or were not privy to when you were initially designing that product. And Gabriella, if, uh, if you have further questions specific to your issue, please send those to the dice at fda.hhs.gov email address and we will absolutely uh, contact you. Thank you very much. So back Let's to see. emails. Um, next question. Um, 
there cannot be a preventive action if you've already seen the 10% drift, correct? Okay. So it's asking. Uh, what this speaks to, and it speaks a little bit to the past callers, is <coughs> entering into those kappa <coughs> thresholds. So if I have a process and I've defined my process that I'm going to have a 10% drift from nominal, there's a nominal level that that process operates at, and before it goes out of compliance that I'm in a nonconformance, I can make changes to that as part of the process itself. It's built into the process that I've defined for my process validation. Now, if this, was, if this drift occurred as an unknown, I define my process that I have a 5%, and it's gone to 10%, guess what? I've already met the threshold that I'm now at a nonconformity. Yes. It's now a corrective action, not a preventive action. So it all depends on how well that process was defined with regards to that drift. And it also speaks to, uh, to really defining your quality system very well uh, and having those sorts of things built into your quality system already so that you don't have to make these preventive or corrective actions. Uh, so that uh, you understand the processes that you have and you can identify um, alert and action limits such that you are able to, under your normal operating uh, uh, requirements, uh, ensure that your process stays within that conforming range uh, even when you start to see drift and you're able to do the calibrations, the equipment maintenance, uh, whatever it is that is necessary um, according to your established procedures about how you're supposed to do things. And that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're taking a preventive action, that you're doing exactly what you said you were going to do. Correct, because we would all love to have, in a perfect world, every process would be robust and everything would be zero scrap and there would be no issues. And even during my presentation, I pulled out a preamble example that talked about if I had a molding process that had 5% um, scrap rate, but then that jumps up to 10%, do I need to do a corrective and preventive or a corrective action? And yes, if I know if I defined it at five percent, but now it's jumped to ten, I'm now outside of what I understood was my regular operating conditions. Thank you. Okay, we have another caller. Um, let's take a question from Sunny in San Jose, California. Sunny, Sunny, your line is open. Okay, while we're waiting, go ahead and take another question okay. from the... Uh, <clears throat> next email question. How, how far back in history should we look in order to consider an event as recurring? How far back in history? Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on when the procedures were actually implemented that defined um, that you had a nonconformance, the specifications that were actually met. So it really depends on, you know, when your device was put on the market, when you actually manufacture it, the manufacturing date. So it, it would depend. Okay. Yes. And I, I would draw your attention to um, the part of the requirement relating to statistical methodology. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's the important thing is to identify a statistical methodology by which you can really identify how you define recurring. Um, it, and the important thing is that it is a statistically um, adequate uh, method. And so if you, are, if you have a statistical methodology that, that works well, that should be dictating how you look at that sort of thing. Correct. And that should be tied back into the rationale as to why you pulled that statistical methodology and why you set the threshold that you set. And then be able to explain that to the investigator or explain it to anyone else, because if you can't explain it to us, then it tells me you don't properly understand that method either. Okay. All right, our next emailed question. Um, earlier, um, we discussed that you must verify or validate the kappa. Why is it an or and not an and? <laughs> And um, how come only one of these activities is necessary? So who wish? Yes. Eric? Uh, so <laughs> it should be better qualified as 
or slash and, um, okay. but you can do both. Okay. Um, the, the reason why it's or is because it's very dependent on the situation. And I know we keep saying it's dependent on the situation, but the, the reality is you need to do one or the other according to what's necessary for the situation that you're in. You don't have to do both, uh, but there may be instances where there is something that warrants doing both, uh, but it's not a necessity. And there's a couple of follow-up to this question. Maybe, Tanya, you can handle this one. Um, mm -hmm. Are these terms overlapping or redundant? And then um, perhaps we can re-clarify the different distinct definitions again. All right. So definitely the, these are two <coughs> different activities, and um, the agency actually provides you with some examples of when you must conduct validation activities versus verification. Um, also, you want to look at the difference between verification activities versus validation. If you're validating um, a process, you want to demonstrate by objective evidence that this process, you're able to um, conduct this process over and over and then um, obtain the same output product that meets your specification. Verification, here you are demonstrating that a particular specification has actually um, been met. So here you want to look at um, the difference in what activities you're trying to, to conduct in order to meet your objective for that particular. Correct. Activity. And I would add to that, it, all of them go back to the objective evidence piece, but if you go to the definition section in the quality system regulation itself, it pulls out the exact definition of verification, validation, and then further defines both process validation and design validation. So even within validation, you need to know what exactly am I talking about with regards to that validation. So can we take one more question from the email, please? Okay, so one, the last emailed question. A lot of medical device companies today utilize contract manufacturers for manufacturer. How do you recommend handling CAPA in those cases? Does the contract manufacturer um, own the CAPA process or um, is that the responsibility of the device company, the parent company? So it's definitely um, the responsibility of the device, the medical device manufacturing company. However, that medical device manufacturer wants to make sure that he have those provisions within their purchasing control agreements with their contract manufacturer as to what activities they want them to perform when they've actually identified a non-conformance with the, the product or the processes or whatever it is that they are contracting out to make sure that they are handling it and then that manufacturer, that finished device manufacturer, can ensure that that contract manufacturer has actually handled those issues appropriately. So the finished device has that ownership. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I definitely agree with that. And uh, the, the important thing to note is that it is very dependent on that agree the agreement that you have with your contractor because uh, the what the finished device manufacturer is responsible for is ensuring that somebody is doing it. Um, you can do it, your contractor can do it, but ultimately it's the finished device manufacturer's responsibility for ensuring that it gets done. Okay, unfortunately we'll have to end on that note. <laughs> and um, I'm sorry we've run out of time, so thank you so much panelists. Okay. And if we didn't get to your questions today, please be sure to send it to DICE at fda.hhs.gov. The slides for today's presentation, all the, all of the presentations, are available now on CDRH Learn, and the video segments should be available in about two weeks. Thank you all for your participation and for your thoughtful questions. This concludes this, section, this portion of our CDRH Industry Basics Workshop. Please stay tuned for our next and final presentation on Electronic Medical Device Reporting, or EMDRs, which will begin at 3 o'clock. Also, please don't forget to provide your feedback by completing the survey, which is provided on our website at www.fda slash CDRH webinar. See you in just a little while.
Hello, my name is Andrew Shao, and I'm a Consumer Safety Officer in the Division of Industry and Consumer Education. Before I joined this division, I was a Medical Device Reporting Analyst in the Office of Surveillance and Biometrics, where my entire job function revolved around the Medical Device Reporting Regulations found in Part 803. Today, I will be presenting to you on Medical Device Reporting, which is abbreviated MDR. MDRs are an important post-market surveillance tool that FDA uses to ensure the safety of medical devices in the U.S. market. Now, why should you, a member of the medical device industry, care about MDRs? Because the information gathered from MDRs can be utilized in your quality system to improve your product, increase your market share, and decrease the money you lose from recalls and lawsuits. Now that I've established the importance of MDRs, let me now review this presentation's learning objectives. We need to first understand the basic MDR regulation before we can delve into the medical device reporting electronic submission requirements final rule. In this last part of this presentation, I will then review the basic process for preparing and submitting electronic medical device reports, which is abbreviated EMDRs. Now, before I begin, I just want to provide a friendly reminder regarding complaint files. The FDA regulations found in the Code of Federal Regulations, Title 21, are often intertwined, and this is an example of how the MDR regulations are intertwined with the quality system regulations. If you are unsure of the complaint file requirements in the quality systems regulations, then it would be highly suggested that you review 21 CFR 820.198 when you get the chance. Let's now begin the basic requirements found in the MDR regulations. FDA has the authority to require mandatory medical device reports from manufacturers, importers, and device user facilities. A manufacturer is defined as any person who manufactures, prepares, propagates, compounds, assembles, or processes a device by chemical, physical, biological, or other means. This includes domestic manufacturers, contract manufacturers, specification developer, farm manufacturers, repackagers, and relabelers. Now, repackagers and relabelers are often not thought of as manufacturers, but FDA includes them in its definition of a manufacturer, and thus manufacturer MDR requirements also apply to relabelers and repackagers. Importer means any person who imports a device into the U.S. and who furthers the marketing of a device from the original place of manufacture to the person who makes the final delivery or sale to the ultimate user, but who does not repackage or otherwise change the container, wrapper, or labeling of the device or device package. A device user facility means a hospital, ambulatory surgical facility, nursing home, outpatient diagnostic facility, or outpatient treatment facility. Please note that a physician's office, school nurse offices, and employee health units are not considered to be device user facilities. Please be advised that an MDR report does not constitute an admission that the device, reporting entity, or the entity's employees caused or contributed to the reportable event. Now, this is an important disclaimer because without it, FDA would likely not receive enough MDR reports in order to conduct post-market trending and carry out its mission of protecting the U.S. public health. Now, when do MDR requirements apply? User facilities are required to report once they become aware of, of information that reason suggests that a device may have caused or contributed to a patient death or serious injury. Manufacturers and importers are also required to report when they become aware of, inf of information that reasonably suggests that their device caused or contributed to a death or serious injury. However, manufacturers and importers have the added responsibility to report malfunctions that will likely cause or contribute to a death or serious injury if the malfunction were to recur. At this point, you may be curious as to what a serious injury is as opposed to a non-serious injury, and you will find FDA's definition of a serious injury in 21 CFR 803.3. However, I would encourage you to review the guidance document, Medical Device Reporting for Manufacturers, in the reference section to gain a better understanding of what type of adverse events are considered to be serious injuries. Similarly, the guidance document also provides information regarding MDR reportable malfunctions. 
Now, let's move on to other MDR report types and time frames. In addition to submitting MDRs, manufacturers are required to submit A, supplemental reports, which are also known as follow-up reports to a previously submitted MDR, and B, five-day reports. Five-day reports are for events that require remedial action to prevent an unreasonable risk of substantial harm, and the manufacturer has five business days to submit this report to the FDA. Please note that the mandatory reporting timeframes begin on the day after the mandatory reporter becomes aware of a MDR reportable event. Now, I like this chart because it nicely summarizes the MDR reporting requirements for mandatory reporters. This chart also tells you what type of adverse events mandatory reporters are required to report, who the event needs to be reported to, and what the time frame is. Manufacturers have 30 days to submit MDR reports of death, serious injuries, and certain types of malfunctions. For five-day reports, manufacturers have five business days. And for supplemental reports, manufacturers have one month to report to FDA. User facilities are required to report deaths and serious injuries to FDA within 10 business days. And importers have 30 calendar days to submit MDR reports of death, serious injuries, and certain types of malfunctions. Now that you have a general understanding of MDR reporting requirements, let's delve into the EMDR requirements. So what is an EMDR? An EMDR is a file containing one or more MDR reports in an electronic format that FDA can process, review, and archive. Let's now review the EMDR basics in the Medical Device Reporting Electronic Submission Requirements Final Rule. On February 14, 2014, FDA published the Medical Device Reporting Electronic Submission Requirements Final Rule in the Federal Register. Please note that this final rule can be accessed via the reference section at the end of this presentation. As stated in the final rule, EMDR requirements will take effect on August 14, 2015. If your company is not yet EMDR compliant, then it would be suggested that you plan accordingly so that your company will be EMDR compliant by August 14, 2015. Please, please, please. Do not wait until August 14, 2015 to begin the process of becoming EMDR compliant. The final rule also stated that manufacturers and importers will be subject to EMDR. Specifically, manufacturers must submit initial and supplemental reports to FDA in an electronic format that FDA can process, review, and archive. Similarly, importers must also submit initial reports to FDA in an electronic format. User facilities will continue to submit reports to FDA and the manufacturer in a paper format via FDA Form 3500A. Please note that the final rule did not change what must be included in an MDR report or when the report should be submitted. The primary change that will take place on August 14, 2015 is that the method for submitting MDRs to FDA has changed for manufacturers and importers from a paper format to an electronic method. The final rule also made changes to record keeping requirements. The final rule amended Part 803 to require EMDR submitters to retain all paper or electronic copies of the EMDRs submitted. Please note that firms may choose whether the copies are retained via paper or electronic means. Furthermore, all acknowledgments that FDA sends to manufacturers need to be retained, and I'll discuss what acknowledgments are in a few slides. Now that you understand the MDR and EMDR regulatory requirements, I will now review the basic process for preparing and submitting EMDRs to FDA. EM EMDRs that are submitted to the FDA are received by the Electronic Submission Gateway, which is abbreviated as ESG. The ESG is a central transmission point for sending information electronically to the FDA. In addition, the ESG acts as a secure entry point for all electronic submissions sent to the FDA, and the ESG then relays the product-specific report to the appropriate FDA center, which in the case of EMDR is CDRH, the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. In order to submit EMDRs to the ESG, 
the submitter will be required to receive a digital certificate from FDA, and I will elaborate further on this point when I discuss web trader information. Now that you understand the basics of the ESG, let's now briefly delve into what happens next. Once an EMDR is received by FDA's ESG, then it will automatically send Acknowledgement 1 to the submitter, and Acknowledgement 1 indicates that the ESG submission was received at the FDA ESG. The EMDR report is then sent to CDRH database, whereupon the CDRH database automatically sends Acknowledgement 2 to the submitter. Acknowledgement 2 indicates that the EMDR submission has reached CDRH. Once CDRH's database receives the EMDR report, the database will attempt to load the EMDR report into the adverse event database. At this point, the database will automatically send Acknowledgement 3 to the submitter to indicate the pass or failure status of the submitted EMDR into CDRH's adverse event database. I'll talk about what you can do if you received Acknowledgement 3 failure status in the next slide. But please note that if there are no errors, the three acknowledgement letters will be generated within 24 hours of submission. Now that you understand the process of generating acknowledgement letters, let's discuss who you should contact in case there are issues with any of the acknowledgement letters. I have provided a link in the reference section that you can utilize to check the status of the ESG. If the ESG system status website indicates the ESG is operating normally, and you did not receive Acknowledgement 1 or 2, then please contact the ESG staff at the email address stated. I have also provided a link in the reference section that you can utilize to check the system uh, status of the EMDR. If the EMDR system status website indicates EMDR is operating normally and you did not receive Acknowledgement 3, then please contact the EMDR staff at the email address stated. If you receive an Acknowledgement 3 error message, then please fix the error in the EMDR report that you submitted and then resubmit the EMDR to FDA. If you do not understand the Acknowledgement 3 error messages for the adverse event report submitted to CDRH and need help interpreting the error, then please contact the EMDR staff for interpretation. Now that you understand the big picture of how an EMDR is submitted to FDA, Let's discuss how you can obtain a web trader account from the ESG in order to submit EMDRs to the ESG. Please follow the instructions in the link setting up a web trader account checklist in the reference section below. You will note that there are preparatory activities, such as obtaining a digital certificate, that you will have to perform in order to set up a production account. Regardless, please follow the instructions in setting up a web trader account. During the process of setting up a web trader account, you may have questions or require assistance. For policy questions and to request a web trader account, please contact the FDA through the email address stated. For assistance with the registration or testing process, please contact the ESG staff at the email address indicated. When you have the electronic infrastructure in place in order to submit EMDRs to FDA, then please be advised that there are two methods for submitting EMDRs to FDA. The first method is via eSubmitter, and this method allows reporters to submit EMDRs individually. Please note that eSubmitter is a free software that you can download from the FDA. In the reference section, I have provided a link titled eSubmitter download and installation that you can use to download the eSubmitter software. As such, eSubmitter acts as a standard software that eases the technical EMDR reporting burden for manufacturers and importers. Furthermore, eSubmitter generates an electronic version of FDA Form 3500A in a zip file format which is then sent to FDA via the ESG. You will be able to save or print this electronic ge generated version on your computer. Lastly, please note that the e-submitter will also allow attachments to be included in an EMDR submission. The second method for submitting EMDRs to FDA is through Health Level 7, which is abbreviated HL7. 
HL7 is a standard for the capture of the information needed to support the submission of MDR reportable events. HL7 allows reporters to extract information directly from the reporter's database, to populate an EMDR submission, and for the transmission of the EMDR submission to the FDA ESG. As such, HL7 allows EMDRs to be submitted in large batches or even one at a time. Firms that choose to submit EMDRs using HL7 will need to develop their own custom EMDR solution using HL7. Furthermore, firms that choose to use HL7 as their method of submitting EMDRs are encouraged to develop capabilities for saving and printing submitted reports and their attachments. If you would like additional information regarding HL7, then please utilize the link Health Level 7 Individual Case Safety Reporting in the reference section. Okay, I have covered the basic MDR regulation and provided an overview of the Medical Device Reporting Electronic Submission Requirements Final Rule. I then reviewed the basic process for preparing and submitting EMDRs to FDA. Let me now re-emphasize three major points from this presentation. Point one, please do not wait until August 14th, 2015 to get an ESG account. I cannot emphasize this point enough. Point two, the method for submitting MDRs to FDA has changed. However, other MDR requirements have generally not changed. Point three, eSubmitter and HL7 are two methods that you can use to submit EMDRs to FDA. This is the reference section that I have alluded to in my presentation. It would be suggested that you review the information in these links. These web pages will allow you to gain a stronger understanding of the material that I have covered in this presentation. In addition, Device Advice and CDRH Learn are two great resources for industry education. If you'd like to contact the Division of Industry and Consumer Education, then please note our contact information here in this slide. If you need help interpreting MDR policy or would like to request an exemption, then please contact the MDR policy branch. You can find their contact information in this slide. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this presentation helpful. Thank you for viewing the MDR presentation. I hope you found it informative. I'm Heather Howe, Deputy Director of CDRH's Office of Communication and Education. And this is Elias Malice, Director of our Division of Industry and Consumer Education. We're joined now by your presenter, Mr. Andrew Chow. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Heather. Also joining us to help respond to your questions are two experts from CDRH's Office of Surveillance and Biometrics, Victoria Schmidt, Consumer Safety Officer in the MDR Policy Branch, and Mark Wilson, Policy Health Analyst in the Information Analysis Branch. Please remember, you can submit questions by clicking the Ask a Question icon, which appears at the top of your screen. You can also call the phone number you see on the screen now. To ask your question live, if, uh, call, that, click that, call that number to ask your question live. If we don't have time to get to your questions today, you can submit them to our Division of Industry and Consumer Education at dice at fda.hhs.gov. While we're waiting for your calls, we'll get started with some email questions you've already submitted. So let's get to the first question. What do I do if my company anticipates that we will not be ready to file EMDRs by August 14, 2015? So, Victoria, could you address this question? Certainly. Um, we've, we've been receptive to firms uh, participating in electronic submission of MDRs for some time since 2008. Um, so we anticipate, a lot, particularly a lot of the large volume reporting firms have already addressed this. We do caution you, however, if you have not yet uh, begun the process of applying for e EMDR submissions, that you don't wait to the last minute. Um, companies that have justification for not being ready, if, the, if they can't make their HL submission ready on time, can make a request to us for uh, a variance in the reporting or a, an exemption for, from reporting. But 
once again, don't wait till the last minute to try that. That's a good message. Thank you. So we'll get to our second email question. Um, Mark, um, is an MDR required for malfunction that does not cause a serious injury or death? Um, I think that's. Oh, I think that might be my vehicle. question. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. If you have a malfunction that has not caused a, a death or serious injury, the the question that you need to ask yourself is: Is this the type of malfunction that could cause a death or serious injury if it were to recur? And we have a number of different uh, situations that we've proposed in the preamble when we published the regulation initially. And it talks about whether it's a uh, significant device that represents a, a risk to patients. Uh, whether there's been an injury or not, it still could represent a risk. Also, if there's been a previous death or serious injury, then companies are under an obligation to report all future malfunctions for a period of time. Um, there are other situations uh, that may apply, and each company has to analyze their product and the malfunction involved to see what type of risk is represented. And if they consider it likely to cause or contribute, then that would need to be reported as a malfunction. And if I can maybe add to that, Elias, um, we have great guidance document online, and I, I think I've referenced that in my PowerPoint slide as well. So um, there's a great guidance document on, 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 on just medical device reportability, and I would encourage you if you have a, have a question, maybe to take a look at that first. There's a lot of great scenarios that are outlined when they are reportable when they're not. Thank you, Andrew. So, uh, Mark, we'll give you this question. School, um, school nurses' offices or doctors' offices, since they are not considered user facilities, this exempts them from all MDR reporting requirements. And I think that's it's a question, so is again, that the case? Again, I think I have to boot that to my colleague. <laughs> Yes. Um, the, the examples that you were providing are similar to physicians' offices, and physicians' offices are not considered user facilities and under the mandatory reporting obligation. But we do point out that there is a voluntary reporting program that can be used by um, any entity, even those that are, that are normally considered um, subject to mandatory reporting, if they have the type of event to, to, that they want to bring to FDA's attention and it doesn't meet mandatory reporting requirements, they still can use the voluntary reporting system. Thank you. So our next emailed question, um, where can I find the definitive FDA definition of serious injury? Sure, and I can address that question. Mm -hmm. um, as I stated in my presentation, um, 803.3 is where the definition of serious injury is defined. Um, however, again, I would encourage our viewers to take a look at the guidance document for and for manufacturers, um, it actually defines it, or it, it defines the definition of serious injury again and provides some things that you might consider uh, when you determine if an adverse event that was reported is in, in fact a serious injury or not. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. The next emailed question, does the e-submitter use for MDR submission have any additional compliance requirements? Or can we create the file using eSubmitter and send it to FDA using ESG? All right, sure. I, that's a great question. Uh, yes, so the sole purpose of the eSubmitter is to remove all the technical burdens uh, that leads to generating the HL7 ICSR zip file. Um, so, yes, uh, that is the correct method uh, to generate that ICSR zip file and submit it via the ESG. Thank you. Our next question. If we have a cleared 510K for a medical device that is not distributed in the United States, but it's only distributed overseas, do we need to submit an MDR to the FDA if an issue occurs abroad? A uh, United States manufacturer that ships a product overseas, um, I'm, I'm not sure if that <coughs> question involves the foreign manufacturer or a U.S. manufacturer. But in our manufacturer's guidance for MDR, we talk about a number of different scenarios that address this. Um, if, if it's a U.S. manufacturer and they're not marketing in the U.S., but they have the 510K or the PMA, they could at any time begin marketing. And so we have, we have put out a policy that says that we consider those subject to MDR reporting. And so uh, looking at the guidance can give you further assistance. The foreign manufacturers also need to look at whether the product that's sold overseas is similar, the same or similar to a product that's in the United States and, and use that factor as part of their 
evaluation of whether to report. Thank you. Our next email question, are the contract manufacturers also required to submit EMDRs or should it uh, be won by the legal entity? Well, I assume you're talking about the specifications developer, which would be the uh, firm that markets the product. And uh, we have, have looked at this situation um, as proposed in our, our draft guidance. And uh, we believe that the, the implication is that if the contract manufacturer is making the product but providing it back to the specification developer for final shipment and distribution, they would not have an MDR reporting obligation. But we do encourage them to include in their SOPs and in their procedures an agreement between the two firms that clearly establishes the MDR reporting obligations. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question is about this, the deadline coming up. Can EMDRs be submitted immediately or must we wait until August of 2015? Um, absolutely not. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of manufacturers that, already, that are EMDR compliant. Um, so we're already accepting EMDR. So okay. we encourage any company out there that is thinking about becoming EMDR compliant to please consider um, uh, getting a web trader account as soon as they can. Okay. So it sounds like we're ready to go, and the sooner the better. All right. Our next emailed question. At what stage of the acknowledgement process is the EMDR considered on time or officially submitted to FDA? Acknowledgement one, two, or three? Well, acknowledgement one is the one that's, that's um, sent to the, the company when the report reaches the FDA electronic uh, gate. And so we consider that the date received. The problem is there are three stages of acknowledgement letters, and each stage has to be completed successfully in order for the report to be accepted at, the, at our database. So unless a company receives Acknowledgement 3, assuring that it's been accepted, um, Acknowledgement 1 doesn't work. But Acknowledgement 3 will give them the errors and the problems. And so once, once those are corrected and resubmitted, it's the new uh, Acknowledgement 1 that's, that shows the date received. Okay. Um, so I'd just like to add. Okay. Um, so the electronic submission is deemed... Uh, successful once the user have received Acknowledgement 3. Um, so therefore, that Acknowledgement 3 uh, actually validates uh, that timestamp that is actually found on Acknowledgement 1. And that's considered on time that is for the purpose of this question. So Mark, perhaps you can elaborate a little bit. Let's say a, a EMDR failed to receive Acknowledgement 3 uh, or failed to pass Acknowledgement 3. Um, so it would, Acknowledgement 1 and Acknowledgement 2 were both passed, but Acknowledgement 3 failed. Could you speak, if they resubmit the report, how the uh, deadline changes? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so uh, in that particular scenario, you know, the user should actually uh, reach out and if they actually have a clear understanding of the uh, error message, to reach out to the EMDR uh, mailbox uh, with additional information. Thank you. Our next emailed question, there's quite a few coming in, so keep them coming. Are resellers and contract installers, both within and outside of the United States, required to notify the manufacturer of an MDR reportable event? And there's more parts, but I'll, we'll pause on this one. You, the, def, the company defines themselves as what? So are resellers and contract installers, inside and outside the U.S., mm -hmm. required to notify the manufacturer of an MDR reportable event? So I, I'm interpreting this as the manufacturer is the primary device manufacturer and the reseller and, and contract installers interact with the Well, reseller, device. if that's a distributor, possibly a domestic distributor that you're talking about, they have uh, MDR record-keeping obligations but not reporting obligations. Um, I, th I think people need to look at how we defined... Uh, importers and distributors to see whether they come under that obligation or not or whether they, they fit the definitions for any of the entities required to report. And perhaps if the reseller is as well, um, perhaps they're changing the device or maybe mm -hmm. reprocessing device. Um, I would caution if, if, if the reseller does those activities because they might become a manufacturer and thus subject to MDR reporting mm -hmm. regulations. So it, again, it also depends on what the reseller does. If they're just a domestic distributor, as, as uh, Vicky mentioned before, then 
it, it stands as uh, what she said. And, okay. and there's a part B to, I think, that elaborates on this question further. Um, so can um, the reseller or contract installer report something themselves, even if they don't fall under the category of a manufacturer, importer, or user device facility? Yes, we encourage companies, if they think they don't have a mandatory reporting obligation, to use the voluntary mm -hmm. program. And the voluntary program would allow them to bring issues to FDA's attention. And even a user facility um, that has no obligation to report malfunctions to FDA can use the voluntary program to bring it, um, an issue to a device issue to our attention. Excellent. Thank you. Let's take the next question from the phone. We have a caller, Phil, from Spokane, Washington. Phil, what is your question? We, develop, we uh, manufacture a device for uh, x-ray, dental x-ray development. And I don't believe that there's any risk of, of death or, or really injury with this device. Uh, if, if MDAs are not being reported because of this situation, does that cause any type of a problem? Does it raise flags, increase audits, which is not necessarily an issue as, in itself? But if we don't have that risk, just because this is not that type of a product, uh, are, is FDA still expecting to see a certain amount of reports coming in from any manufacturer? Um, could you clarify what the device is again? This is a, we, we manufacture a device, it's a, a benchtop uh, uh, dental x-ray equipment. Uh, it's a developer for x-ray, for film. Okay, well, um, there are, of course, uh, radiation uh, regulations for reporting that you need to be aware of as well. But I think the issue would be whether or not you can identify a likelihood of a death or serious injury from problems with this device. If, if you have not had reports of death or serious injuries, if you don't think that the product could result in a death or serious injury, you may have justification for not reporting those events. So, um, you know, that would be one thing. But you do, as I said, have to be sure that you're complying also with the uh, radiation reporting requirements. There's no isotopes, there's nothing involved with this, with it as far as that, it's just strictly strict chemical. So we're, we're talking about just x-ray film. Okay. And the, the device has been manufactured, uh, we, we took over the license on the manufacturing for this device about a year ago. Man the device has been manufactured for a number of years, they've never had any type of a problem like this. It's just a, it's just a fixer and developer and a rinse bottle and it runs through an automatic processing unit in the back of a dental office uh, in their, in their uh, photo lab or, or wherever they want to put it. And so I, I really don't, I don't think that there could be any type of, a, of an injury or, or a, certainly a life-threatening situation. So I, I'll need to go back through and review uh, some of the information that I'm seeing today, obviously. Yeah, uh, um, but, but if that's the situation uh, and you're not receiving any MBAs from us, is that an issue? Well, we don't expect companies to file MDRs unless they have an MDR reportable event. So as long as you um, have done, well, the other thing I would say is if, if this was a product that went out to the public or the health care profession and they were filing complaints with you, you'd also need to be investigating those because you have your um, compliance and your GMP requirements for complaint handling and then that assessment of whether it's MDR reportable or not. And that's, that's from some of the complaints and from what I've seen in the past from the, uh, the original manufacturer. I, I don't see any issues that would be coming up. So I would have to take that as a case-by-case -case, uh, scenario as, as the reports came in and, and validate easy, whether or not it's a risk or not. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Phil. And if you have further questions, please contact DICE. And um, there, are, there is further references on our website for the electronic product um, the, the other, what is it, the EPRC? Well, the radiation health re uh, regulations. Okay. So. so if you could check that out on our website and then contact DICE with specific questions. Um, let's take another question from the phone. We have a question from Roxana in Wayne, New Jersey. Roxana, what is your question? I'm asking you about um, devices. If you see devices coming in, from other um, companies to your facility, what are what are our responsibilities towards you know those devices? 
Your mandatory reporting obligation is for devices that your company manufactures, and that's um, the way the regulation was written. However, if you see a problem with a device, it, it should be reported by the user facility that's involved. Um, they would be obligated to report deaths to the manufacturer and to FDA and serious injuries to the manufacturer. Um, so it, if the user facility is, has an obligation to report, uh, you as, as witness of, of a problem with the device could use the voluntary reporting program, but you don't have a mandatory obligation to report someone else's device. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Let's take another question from email. All right, back to the, the emails. Keep them coming. Our next question. Do we need to keep all three acknowledgement letters as part of our records? Absolutely. Yes, the, the, that's, that's the, the new change, as I mentioned in my presentation. Your, the new record-keeping re requirements are to maintain all three acknowledgement letters. Okay. That's pretty straightforward. Let's get to the next one. Um, do I need to set up a web trader account before I download the eSubmitter software? Or could I download the eSubmitted software first and then set up a web trader account? I'm sure I can answer that. Uh, well, uh, that could go both ways, either or. Um, I prefer that you actually download the eSubmitter application first so that you can go ahead and uh, train on it uh, so you can be, become efficient in it uh, and then move towards the, uh, the FDA uh, web trader account. Thank you. Next email question. Did you state that the day the mandatory reporter hears of the MDR is reporting day zero? Yes, yeah, so uh, the day a manufacturer or any mandatory reporter becomes aware of an adverse event that is MDR reportable, the clock starts on the following day. So I'm not sure if I want to call it day zero or not, but the first day is the next day. Okay. Next question. Are all reportable events, MDRs, complaints by default? Yes. So um, the analogy I like to make is if you have two... Um, two circles if you remember Venn diagrams from back in middle school or high school. So all complaints are, well, all MDRs are complaints. So if you have an inner circle, that's MDRs, and an outer circle, that's complaints, mm -hmm. then all MDRs are complaints. However, all complaints are not MDRs. Okay. Because an MDR, to be an MDR, you have to have some element of risk either a death or serious injury as a result of the use of the device yes. or a malfunction that could result in a death or serious injury. And one other thing, um, if a device causes or contributes to death or serious injury, it may not even have malfunctioned. It simply is the matter of the device, something about the use of the device has caused or contributed to a death or serious injury. That would be a reportable MDR as well. Okay, thank you. So our next question is the information from eSubmitter transferred to HL7? If yes, how, and what is the benefit of using HL7? Well, yes, again, the purpose of eSubmitter is to generate the HL7 ICSR compliant uh, uh, zip file. And uh, so, again, that's the sole purpose uh, of that to remove that particular that technical burden. Okay, thank you. The next question is about timing. Um, approximately how long does it take to set up a web trader test account and gain approval to a production account? Oh, that's another great question. <laughs> um, so the answer to that question is it generally takes two to six weeks uh, okay. for the user to receive a production ready account. Okay. It's good that folks are thinking ahead. <laughs> <laughs> next question. If we attempt to submit a report via EMDR, on the actual due date, but then the report fails submission. Um, the report is then subsequently submitted after the due date. Will this be considered late? Well, as I, as I noted before, if you fail to, um, if your submission is not accepted on that first go-round, then the second, the second time that you submit it, you get a new set of acknowledgement letters, and your date received is going to be the date of that second acknowledgement one letter and uh, assuming that it gets accepted the second time so uh, presumably at least early on in the process if you're if you're not uh, if you're com 
applications aren't always going to uh, process through right away. That's the, the advantage of the, the pre-testing and making sure that everything works. Um, you'll, you would have a problem if you're not going to have it, if your report isn't accepted the first time. Okay, thank you. Our next question, can an OUS, that is outside the United States, manufacturing facility submit EMDRs without a U.S. agent? Uh, we do have foreign manufacturers submitting events, but if, <coughs> if they're marketing the product in the United States, they presumably have someone that's serving the function of importer. So uh, I believe that they could make a judgment that the foreign manufacturer could file the MDRs, but I'm not sure whether I'm, cor I, I believe I'm correct that they would have an importer involved as well. So someone would have to fill the importer function of filing an MDR as well as the foreign manufacturer. And they could submit a single report that does both of those functions, but they should have some type of an agreement between them and perhaps contact us about the need for an exemption for reporting. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. This next question, I think talk, we talked a little bit about before the web trader account and ESG. Um, so this question asks, what's the difference between the two? Okay. Um, so the ESG, uh, the ESG is the uh, center, uh, the center entry point to uh, the FDA. Uh, so essentially, uh, the ESG and the web trader account is the same thing. Um, so again. The web trader account is solely uh, to uh, provide uh, that handshake uh, among the systems to assure that your EMDR is coming from uh, your particular uh, vendor. So the follow-up question is, do we require both accounts? Uh, yes. So uh, initially, there is <coughs> only one account is a web trader account. So once you have actually uh, established a web trader account, uh, there is no additional account uh, to be needed. The okay. second step is actually uh, going through the testing scenarios with CDRH. Uh, Excellent. Thank you, Mark. No problem. All right. So the next question is all about this coming deadline. So this is great. If I set up an e-submitter account now, am I obligated to start electronic submissions right away prior to the August 2015 deadline? Or may I continue to submit paper submissions until, until that time? Well, I believe that just because they have the account, they wouldn't have to file uh, electronic reports. But I think it's good that they've made the provisions now for uh, establishing that they can perform that function and, and have their reports accepted in a timely fashion. Thank you. This next question, does it make sense for a manufacturer to obtain an EMDR account before submitting a 510K? I don't think they have anything to do with each other. Yeah, um, so <coughs> if, if your device is not even clear to be on the market yet, um, it texts, theoretically should have no adverse events because it's not on the market to begin with. But once it's on the market, <coughs> once you receive clearance and the device is on the market, then there's potential for adverse events to happen. And at that point, you definitely need to have an EMDR account. Um, and maybe reading more into this question, in terms of a manufacturer trying to be getting ready, getting everything all lined up, is there any benefit potentially to trying to obtain an EMDR account? Well, um, when you say <coughs> EMDR, uh, there are other obligations under the medical device reporting regulation. Um, they should have their MDR event files. They should have procedures. They should have a, a framework for establishing um, a report evaluation and, and uh, submitting reports. But the, the EMDR, I think, because we've already noted that it can take two to six weeks to, to come up to speed for submission, if once August comes by and they're required to submit electronically, they would need to already have all of that uh, framework in place. Okay. The next question. When multiple persons at a facility submit EMDRs via web trader, does each person need a separate digital certificate and a separate web trader account? I can answer that question. So if you actually have two separate users wanting a separate web trader account, you will actually need two separate uh, digital certificates. Okay. Did you say what type of facility that would be? It just says, um, the question just says, when multiple persons at a facility. 
So, so if it's a user facility, then we would really want all of them to be coming in from from the same facility, but they are they don't have an electronic reporting obligation, so maybe you're talking from the point of view of a manufacturer. And you mm -hmm. could have an entire department that handles MDR reporting, and they would all probably need to come in through a single uh, portal or, or Yes, uh, it depends account. on that uh, department setup. Yeah. Um, so if they're actually you know, wanting a single user to be responsible for submitting, that's a single web trader account and a single digital certificate. Excellent. OK, our next question. If the IT network is down, which never happens, of course, <laughs> do we have an alternate um, method to submit the MDR to ensure timely reporting? Well, if, if what you're talking about is a, um, a scheduled ESG downtime, they would be able to find that on the, the, um, the, the website. The website yes. Right. If, if that's what we're talking about is something out of the control of the company, then they should just document in H10 of their MDR report that they were they attempted and were okay. unable to. We would not want them to revert to paper reporting because that's counterproductive for all of us. Right. You know, with since we're going toward electronic reporting, if the problem is at the user facility, they need to have made some. Con or, I'm sorry, at the manufacturer's end, if there's a problem, then they need to have made provisions for how they will handle times when their own part of the program is if, not working. If their network is down. Right. Okay. So um, the, the focus, of course, would be to receive these reports electronically, and that's yes. what our hope is, and hopefully not too much time um, delay for them. But if they document that they attempted to file on the first of the month and the ESG was down until the third of the month, then that would be their um, protection against someone considering them late for reporting. So they don't have to resubmit? Well, they would need to report once the ESG is functioning again, but that would be the documentation that would show why the report came in two days later than it should have. Thank you. Our next emailed question, if I already have a WebTrader account for other FDA-required reporting, is there anything additional I must do in order to be in compliance with EMDR reporting? Uh, no. So once you have a, an established WebTrader account, uh, for any other center, um, again, you can actually submit uh, to CRH. Uh, the the reason is that uh, within the ESG, the FDS, the FDA ESG Web Trader account, you have the ability uh, to select from the given center. Thank you. So this next question, I think. Um, we just discussed this, but I'd like to ask it one more time, just to make sure there's maybe nothing else to, to add. Um, if for some reason the manufacturer's EMDR system is down, would it be okay for us to submit hard copies to the FDA instead of, in order to meet the, the deadline, the due date? Well, I believe there's an email address for EMDR, and rather than submitting uh, paper reports at that time, I think they need to submit a, a message um, explaining what the issue is and how many reports are involved, because if there's a very large number of reports we certainly would not want to um, process on paper if, if mm -hmm. the period of time down is going to be um, you know, a reasonable length of time. But they do need to contact us so that we can discuss each incident individually or you know, the, the specifics of each event. OK. Our next question, is the ESG website available to accept EMDRs 24-7? Or are there specific times that the EMDRs are accepted? For example, if I submitted an EMDR on Saturday, will I get all three acknowledgement letters that same day? Well, uh, it depends on the actual uh, queue, how many submissions are in the queue. Um, so uh, again, it's subjective to the number of submissions within the queue itself. OK, thank you. Next question, is EMDR rule applicable to the safety case reportable in medical device clinical trials? You said EMDR? Is, so the exact question, is the EMDR rule uh -huh. applicable to the safety case reportable in medical device clinical trials? Well, I believe that could be uh, related to um, some questions that have come up about 
when a device under investigational exemption, um, studies mm -hmm. under exemption, is also subject to MDR. And we've had some interpretations from our uh, Office of Chief Counsel that there are cases where it, a device would be an adverse event or a problem with the device would be subject to reporting under both. And so we do have that manufacturer guidance that we put out that we attempted to sort those issues out. But if it's a marketed product, it's subject to MDR. And some IDE studies are using marketed product in their studies, and so it would be subject to both IDE and MDR reporting. Okay, thank you. The next question. We repackage products which are listed by our customers on the FDA's website. From what we understand, we don't need to file EMDRs, but do we need a procedure stating our responsibilities to contact our customers with respect to death or serious injury? Well, when you say repackage, that sounds like they're meeting the definition of manufacturer, yes, so indeed. I'm not sure why they think they don't have an MDR obligation. Yeah, repackagers okay. and relabelers are uh, subject to MDRs, and I, I stated that you know, repackagers and relabelers often don't think of themselves as manufacturers, mm -hmm. but according to FDA's understanding of a manufacturer and what manufacturing activity is, repackagers and relabelers are subject to MDR reportability because they are manufacturers. Okay. Well, that's good. That, you, that is a good um, question to have clarified for our, our audience. Our next question, for adverse event reporting, do we have to file a report for each component and or device involved or just one report for the event? So event versus device and device components. Well, um, I think it depends on the situation and what we're talking about as a component. Um, you might have a patient that is using a, an infusion pump and a catheter and something else. And so if there's a problem and they're not sure which of the devices is involved in the patient adverse event, then they would need to submit a report for each of those or they need to identify each of those three. Uh, our initial MDR reporting regulation had required a baseline report when they filed MDRs, and it would be a separate baseline report required for each of those three devices that I just mentioned. And so... Um, in your MDR report where you have a, a product code identified, you need to be able to have one report for each of those product codes. Okay. Thank you. Next question. Can you comment on the electronic MDR pathway for the device component of a combination drug device product? So combination product question. Drug device combination. Actually, I... I'm not sure that we have an answer for yeah. that. The combination uh, product situation is a little complicated, and I'm not sure we've finalized everything yet. Yeah, it's, it's definitely out of scope for, for this session. Okay. Um, combination products are regulated by a completely different office within FDA. But they can submit that question to us, and we'll get so, back with them. Yes, um, for this, we can certainly follow up afterwards and research this. The next question, does hospitalization in and of itself deem the event reportable? Again, I think this comes back to the definition of a, a serious injury. Um, so I would encourage our, the, the person asked this question to mm -hmm. take a look at our guidance for our manufacturers. Um, well, yeah, and patients that are involved in device events are, may already be in the hospital, so I'm not sure if what you're talking about is a patient that because of the use of a device has been injured further and required hospitalization or an emergency room visit or some other type of medical intervention. The way I, I guess the way we've been reading this question, just on the kind of broadest terms, the fact that someone was hospitalized regardless of anything else, does that alone um, deem that um, the hospitalization be reportable? Well, it suggests that there's an injury to that patient, mm -hmm. and so you would need to look at the serious injury definition and see whether what you have is something that's either life-threatening or requires some type of medical or surgical intervention because of the nature of the injury. Okay. Let's take a question from the phone. Um, we have a caller, Chris, from Cypress, California. Chris, what is your question? Chris, your line is open. Is this Chris? Hello? Hi, is this Chris? Yes. Hi, we'll take your call. Okay.
Um, if you have a low risk product and never have submitted an MDR, you don't anticipate that you will ever submit an MDR in the future. Do you have to be EMDR compliant? Can I get you to re repeat that just one time? We're having a little problem with your line. So if, There's some static. I, I think I heard the, the question correctly. You got it? I, I, if I understood her question, it, she, okay. she was asking that if she has a low-risk device, a device that has never had an adverse event before, and she doesn't anticipate ever having another or having a first adverse event to begin with that could be reportable, is, these, is she still subject to EMDR requirements? And the answer would be yes. Well, I believe that all companies are expected to have their MDR event files and their procedures established. And as I mentioned before, if it takes two to six weeks to establish EMDR reporting ability and you get, um, you receive a report, you only have 30 days to submit that report. So you're, um, the odds are against you if you do ever receive a uh, reportable event, how you would come into compliance in time. So it probably wouldn't hurt. Um, there is the possibility of requesting an exemption from uh, electronic reporting, and you would need to justify the reason for submitting that. So that would be another option to submit a request for exemption. Great. Um, and Chris, if that did not answer your question, please send your question to DICE, and we'll take care of that for you. We have time for one more question. Okay. Sir Elias. Our last question for the session and for the day. How exciting. Um, can we use one corporate web trader account and submit M EMDRs for all affiliated companies? I'm sure I can answer that question. And yes, you can. Um, the, um, the only thing you actually have to do is to assure that you elaborate on that particular scenario in your letter of non-repudiation. Thank you. Okay, that's all the time we have today. Thank you, panelists. And thank you all for your participation and for your thoughtful questions. The slides for today's program are available now on CDRH Learn, and the video segments should be available in about two weeks. This concludes today's CDRH Industry Basics Workshop. Please continue to send us your questions, but use the email address dice at fda.hhs.gov. We really appreciate your attention to today, and we look forward to your feedback. Please don't forget, complete the survey, which is provided on our website, at www.fda.gov slash CDRH webinar. We hope you found this program valuable to you. We look forward to hearing from you at DICE. And remember, we're always here to guide you through the CDRH regulatory program process. We're just a phone call or email away.